Subcommittee will come to order. So ask unanimous consent, the chair be authorized to declare recess during today's hearing without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee today's hearing and ask questions without objection so ordered. Good morning and uh, thank you to today's witnesses for joining the subcommittee's hearing today on the state of aviation safety. Recent tragic aviation incidents at home and abroad have shed new light on what is required to ensure the safety of the traveling public. In addition to the integration of new entrants such as drones into the national airspace, uh, they all present new safety and security challenges. Last Congress, this committee passed the Federal Aviation Administration or the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. Bipartisan legislation which set a solid foundation to improve the safety of the nation's airports, pilots, crew, and passengers. Today's hearing is an opportunity to get to the public's perspective on current risks and challenges facing our aviation system and necessary safety improvements. This testimony will also shape our priorities as we continue our investigation of the Boeing 737 MAX and the oversight of the FAA's implementation of last year's FAA uh, reauthorization bill. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to uh, speak first um, about panel two and then shift to the first panel. So later this morning, we're going to hear from the second panel. And this fall, the committee uh, will discuss the implementation of the FAA Reauthorization Act. Uh, so later at today's hearing, the subcommittee will hear from witnesses on that second panel who are on the front lines of aviation and are critical to ensuring the safety of U.S. aviation. Their testimony will help us prioritize issues for oversight on that legislation. So from the NTSB, when they testify about recommendations outlined in the NTSB most wanted list of transportation safety improvements, I particularly want to hear about Part 135 flight ops and ensuring the safe integration of new technologies. As Congress works to improve the pipeline for the next generation of pilots, debate continues on the strong pilot training rules requiring 1,500 hours of flight time mandated after the Colgan crash. Congress cannot undermine our safety rules simply to respond to market forces of supply and demand. If there's a pilot shortage, I am interested in hearing ALPA's thoughts on the ways to address that without sacrificing safety. Flight attendant fatigue is a pressing aviation issue. However, the FAA continues to delay the implementation of a mandate requiring at least 10 consecutive hours of rest for flight attendants during duty, between duty periods. So I want to hear from the Association of Professional Flight Attendants about the immediate and long-term impacts of that inaction. And as evidenced by recent events, the FAA's certification process is critical to aviation safety. So professional aviation safety specialists can shed more light about that role of safety inspectors and engineers in the process and improvements uh, that are necessary to ensure the safety of U.S. aircraft. And last week, Chair DeFazio, Vice Chair Davids, Congressman Davis and Ferguson and I introduced the Fair and Open Skies Act to prevent foreign air carriers from exploiting a flag of convenience to avoid the regulation of their home countries or otherwise undermine labor standards. So when we get to the panel, I would appreciate Transportation Workers Union as well as ALPA and APFA's support of this bill. And would, uh, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to hear more about the importance of maintaining strong labor, protection, labor protections on safety. I now want to turn to the first panel. The issue of the 737 MAX is not just about stakeholders in the aviation industry. This committee is a public body and therefore has a responsibility to hear from those most impacted, which unfortunately includes at times of tragedy. And on today's first panel are Mr. Paul Giroge and Mr. Michael Stumo, who both lost family in the Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 or ET 302 crash, which itself claimed the lives of 157 people. Chair DeFazio and I asked Mr. Giroge to testify today on behalf of the ET 302 families and to give a voice to the 157 victims of that tragic accident. Mr. Giroge and Mr. Stumo, I can't imagine the immeasurable grief that you and your families are experiencing. So on behalf of the entire committee, for members here today and for those who can't join us, I want to extend our sincerest condolences to both of you and your families and all the families during this very difficult time. And we appreciate your willingness to come testify in front of our committee. Your testimony is a crucial reminder of the international role the U.S. aviation system operates within. This, these crashes occurred on U.S.-made 
U.S. assembled, and U.S. regulated airplanes. The FAA's actions and this committee's efforts clearly have implications for travel around the world. A majority of the victims of ET-302 and Lion Air 610 were not Americans. And therefore, it is only right to hear from someone who can better represent the global community impacted by these tragedies. So I want to thank you, Mr. Giroge, for coming in from Canada last night. Thank you for meeting with us, uh, with Ranking Member Graves and I last night as well, and Mr. Stumo as well. And I want to as well recognize um, Tor Stumo, who's here, um, Michael's son my, and uh, Nina's son. Tomra Vassier is in the audience, and her husband Charles, that, the, she lost her brother Matthew as well. And there are, of course, many other family members who are not here, but are certainly represented in our thoughts, our prayers, and in today's testimony. With that, um, I want to uh, turn to the ranking member, Garrett Graves, for uh, opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, for holding this hearing today. Um, first and most importantly, uh, I want to express my Condolences, and I think on behalf of everyone here uh, for the loss that, that you have experienced. Um, and I appreciate the time and dedication that you have committed yourself to, uh, to ensuring that every single lesson learned from this uh, can be extracted, and most importantly, that no one ever has to go through this again. You know, there's some amazing statistics about aviation travel. We can sit here and talk about how um, since 2000, I think it was... Uh, no, excuse me, since 1997, since 1997, there's been a 95% reduction in aviation accidents, and you can look at the World Health Organization statistics talking about how there are uh, 1.35 million deaths in, um, and, and up to 50 million injuries due annually to, to road crashes. In comparison, there was one death for every 3 million flights in aviation. And, and so we could sit back and say, look, these statistics are great, Think, things are going well, but, but that is absolutely, absolutely not appropriate. And we are gonna continue to ensure that we learn every single thing that we can because the hundreds, over 300 lives that were lost and the experience that y'all are going through is completely unimaginable to me. Um, we met last night and I, I made a commitment to you that the, the process that was used to, to certify this aircraft um, will not in any way be used to, to unground these, these aircraft. And I, I look forward to hearing from you. Um, I know that y'all have committed an extraordinary amount of time to ensuring that, that every single thing that we can learn from this, every single step in this process can be thoroughly examined to ensure that as we move forward that no other family has to go through this again. And I just wanna reiterate the commitment that we made. We're gonna take every lesson learned no matter how painful, no matter the change that it requires and ensure that, that appropriate solutions are put in place. Uh, not, just for, not just for this aircraft, but for all aircraft moving forward. Um, and ensuring that these lessons learned are shared with the international community. Uh, I know we have a number of stakeholders that are here today, pilots, uh, we have some of the service technicians, we have uh, the flight attendants and others that are represented, a lot of other stakeholders that I think have important perspective. Um, but I wanna thank you very much for, for being here today. Uh, Y'all's strength and power ha has been absolutely amazing through this. And uh, Tor, thank you for, for being here as well. It was great to meet with you last night. And I look forward to hearing from your testimony on the second panel as well. Thank you, uh, thank you, Representative Graves. Uh, Chair recognizes the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and again, thanks uh, to the families uh, who are here today and for having the bravery to testify and, and to persevere uh, as we move forward. We lost 346 lives in two flights in five months. And that's why it's so fitting that you're here today to represent uh, those lives, those families. You know, I have been on this subcommittee a long time, 
And you know, back when I was first on the subcommittee, we had what we called the tombstone mentality uh, at the FAA. Uh, too often, we were chasing after an accident to figure out what steps should have been taken, what maintenance should have been required, what went wrong. Uh, and I tried for a number of years to say, you know, you're, you've got this archaic mandate from the 30s uh, that was moved over from the Civil Aeronautics Board to the FAA that you both promote and regulate the industry. That was when it was a nascent industry. It's a mature industry, I would say, and I think that there's a conflict. And I was told, no, there's, there's no conflict, no conflict. And then uh, I had, we were doing an FAA bill, and actually I offered an amendment to strip the promotional authority. I lost here in the committee. And then uh, it was not in the Senate bill either. But then uh, value jet went down, and suddenly, it was, hmm, there's, there's some problems here with oversight, maintenance, sub-subcontracting, all these things. And I got a phone call, I was a pretty junior member, saying, uh, you know that amendment you offered? Yeah, I said the one that was rejected. Well, where would we put it in the bill? And I got about 90% of what I wanted in that bill to strip FAA of its promotional duties and focus them on what they're supposed to be doing is keeping people safe. And it took a number of years, really, for that to, you know, there's like the agency, you know, it has memories and there were people there. Uh, it took a while, uh, but we've been doing pretty well. And then along comes ODA, and when it was first offered, I said, I don't understand how this is gonna work, and what are the firewalls uh, between the Boeing uh, person who works for Boeing and the Boeing person who works supposedly in the public interest for the FAA. Uh, I voted against it when it first went forward, but then when we got around to reauthorization, it seemed like it was working pretty well. We knew we didn't have enough FAA uh, inspectors to do proper oversight. Uh, we raised concerns about that uh, during the reauthorization. Uh, but now uh, we see that there's very, very significant questions being raised in this matter. The committee is involved in a very in-depth investigation in, in addition to other investigations in uh, Justice Department and Inspector General and others uh, are undertaking into how this all happened. Uh, and uh, you know, we, will, uh, we will be uh, uh, hearing from uh, Boeing in the future uh, when we finish going, we've received a trove of documents and uh, we're pouring through them. So that's, that's a work in progress. But we're here today uh, to talk about uh, some concerns that are ongoing and, and hear from the families. There are a few other things in that bill that the FAA has stonewalled. Flight attendant rest, fought for that for years. Mike Capuano did a great job, got it in the bill. We held it. Uh, against uh, the wishes of uh, some of the airlines and uh, those in the Senate, and uh, we persevered. But now the FAA is slow walking that and saying, well, gee, we, we, we can't do that till 2020. I understand one of the airlines is pushing really, really hard uh, to uh, not allow flight attendants to get proper rest. Secondary barriers. Uh, we got that in. We, we know now, which I guess a lot of us hadn't thought about, that you hardly ever have a new type. I mean, here's a 50-year-old plane, and it's still you know, the same type. Um, and the industry tried to say, we will only have secondary barriers in new types of planes. You know, I fly a lot, and the flight attendant behind the food cart with their arms crossed uh, is not much of an obstacle to getting into the flight deck. Uh, so again, uh, we are pushing hard to make certain that the FAA goes forward. There are others that weren't properly addressed, lithium batteries. We've already lost uh, two freighters to lithium battery fires. Uh, foreign repair stations, uh, been raising that issue for uh, a couple of decades now. Uh, they're not properly overseen by the FAA. Some problems with the State Department, other issues. They don't have drug testing, they don't have alcohol testing, they don't have background tests. Uh, checks, 
Uh, and then finally, uh, of course, the stupid government shutdown and all the damage that caused at the FAA and the disruption it caused at the FAA. Uh, and we have legislation that would rectify that to draw on the uh, airport improvement uh, fund, which has like, $9 billion in it, and not have more dumb shutdowns of the FAA. So there's still, still work to be done, uh, and this committee will leave no stone unturned uh, as we go forward to make things better and safer in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair recognizes uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Graves of Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling the, uh, uh, the hearing. I want to join my colleagues uh, in expressing my sincere condolences to the family and to the uh, uh, friends of the victims of both Lion Air, Flight 610 and Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. You know, none of us can truly understand the pain and sorrow um, that they are uh, going through. And we thank you for being here today to share your perspective with the subcommittee as we continue to review the impacts of these two um, terrible tragedies. There's no doubt in my mind that all of us share the common goal of seeking the safest aviation system and striving to improve it here in the United States and all over the world, for that matter. And our efforts in this regard, uh, they have to be constant, they have to be consistent, and they have to be constructive. And this means mitigating risks and developing contingencies in all the areas. And to this end, I'm pleased that we will also hear today from um, the NTSB, uh, as well as labor organizations. <clears throat> These unions represent the men and women uh, who are operating maintaining and servicing uh, U.S. airlines as well as those regulating and inspecting uh, U.S. airlines and manufacturers every single day. And their views are going to assist us in our understanding of the state of aviation safety in the United States and abroad. And I also look forward to testimony from the many other aviation stakeholders and from the Federal Aviation Administration directly on the state of aviation safety uh, that's coming up in a future, future hearing. Again, I want to thank the family members for being here and express my condolences, and with that, I yield back. Thank you. We'll now move uh, to testimony. Um, just for the committee members, uh, Mr. Jiroge will be testifying, and Mr. Stumo um, will um, uh, be here in support and may be available to answer questions as well, but Mr. Jiroge will be testifying. Um, just since this is your kind of first time, so this is first time for everybody, be sure that you're up to the microphone, um, that it's turned on, uh, and if it's pointed at your chin, it's probably a, probably a bit better for the sound, so. Um, and then as well, um, although we tend to limit to five minutes um, in agreement with uh, talking to Mr. Jiroge, if he's gonna go over five, we're not gonna hold him to a fast five on this, so we'll, uh, um, let, let you testify until you're done, and we'll move to questions. Mr. Droger, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Larson and DeFazio, and ranking members Graves and Graves for allowing me to testify today. The Boeing 737 MAX crashes killed my wife, my three children, my mom-in-law and 341 others. Today, I speak not only with my voice, but the voices of my departed family, my mom-in-law and the other 341 victims. My wife, Carol, was a dedicated homemaker and a full-time accountant who wanted to change the world through girl-child education in marginalized communities of Kenya. My six-year-old uh, son, Ryan, was a super intelligent boy who was fascinated by the galaxy and aspired to be an astronaut. My four-year-old daughter, Kelly's singing delighted everyone. My nine-month-old daughter, Ruby, was bubbly and a joy in our family. And my mom-in-law, Anne, was a retired teacher of over 40 years who has shaped the world of young men and women through her teaching and counseling. I think about the last six minutes a lot. My wife and my mom-in-law knew they were going to die. They had to somehow comfort the children during those final moments, knowing they were all their last. I wish I was there with them. It never leaves me that my family's flesh is there in Ethiopia, mixed with the soil, the jet fuel, and pieces of the aircraft. In Canada, Independence Day was celebrated on July 1st. 
I stayed buried in my little house, in my grief, hearing the sounds of celebration and fireworks in the sky. But all I could think about was the 737 Max struggling to gain hate and eventually diving to the ground, killing my whole family and 152 others. If my wife, my children, and my mom-in-law were alive, they would have enjoyed all family activities on Canada Day. Every minute of every day, they would be all around me, full of life and health. I miss them every minute of every day. On April 4th, three weeks after the deaths of my family, in what I have since learned is a shameful pattern of behavior by Boeing and airplane manufacturers, Boeing shifted focus from the root cause of the crashes, which is the design flaws in the 737 MAX and MCAS, and started talking about foreign pilot error. This distracted from correcting the real causes of the crashes and is an insult to humanity. Boeing and their apologists want to shift scrutiny from their single-minded quest for short-term profits over safety and place it on foreign pilots who, like domestic American pilots, were left in the dark by Boeing. Would they have used the term domestic pilot error if the crash happened in the United States? The term foreign pilot error is utter prejudice and a disrespect to pilots and Boeing customers across the world. Boeing used this fallacy of foreign pilot error to avoid the grounding of the 737 MAX after the crash of Lion Air Flight 610 on October 29th last year. That decision killed my family and 152 others in the crash of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 four months later. The FAA should have known that the failure to have triple redundancy in critical safety systems could cause crashes and death. They recklessly left Boeing to police itself. The families demand that the 737 MAX 8 be fully recertified as a new plane because it is too different from the original certified plane. We demand that simulator training be required. Recertification must take place in combination with a full legislative fix for the aviation safety system. The FAA clearly needs a budget sufficient to fulfill safety obligations. The U.S. Senate should only confirm a new FAA administrator if that person agrees to safety reforms. Boeing should not be allowed to act like a mere investment company, extracting wealth to supercharge shareholder returns at the expense of safety and quality. Their leadership should change in favor of engineering safety focus. Other safety critical industries have early warning system data collection with immediate respon responsiveness. The FAA and aviation industry need to have such systems in place. If Boeing's wrongful conduct continues, another plane will dive to the ground, killing me, you, or your children, or your members, or all, all other members of your family. It is you who must be the leaders in this, right, in this fight for aviation safety in the world. Now, future hearings of this committee should include those who wrote the MCAS software, technical dissenters, whistleblowers, safety engineers, and families. You hear multiple testimony from pilots and unions. We, the victims' families, need to continue to be included in these hearings. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Tsuroge, for your testimony, your moving testimony, and your recommendations. We're going to now, as we discussed yesterday, we'll, we'll move to questions, and uh, we'll go one at a time, each side. I'm not sure if all members have questions for you, but um, I'll start. And um, I know you've come with some recommendations for the committee to consider. And uh, I wanted to ask you um, specifically about your written testimony and 
the issue of the changes that we've made about 14 years ago in what we call the ODA, um, in the uh, Organization Designation Authorization. And uh, I wanted to give you a chance to uh, amplify your written testimony, your oral testimony with your, with your written testimony. And can you explain, at least in your mind, the change that, uh, that you think the committee ought to be making and why we ought to be making any, any changes to that, um, to that authority? Michael, do you want to? And, and it's fine if Michael wants to yeah. answer as well, it's fine. And then I'll supplement it later. That's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We as, uh, we as families have become uh, not experts, but we do have some opinions. And we are in touch with a lot of the families from uh, both crashes all over the world and uh, we'll continue uh, providing input and recommendations. It's not just us, but all, all the families because we, we want to include all of them. And our understanding at this point, uh, and I've uh, talked to Boeing safety engineers who have been in the uh, system b back in the DER program versus, uh, and through the transition to ODA, it was explained to me like this. Uh, there have always been timeline pressures and financial pressures, but uh, under the older DER program when, of course, Boeing still paid these engineers, but they reported to FAA. There were two lines of authority, two chains of command, uh, one up through the FAA side, one through the Boeing side, and the safety culture could put a stop to things if something looked wrong. After the ODA system, and I'm not sure this is entirely clear from the black and white text of reading about these systems, after the ODA system, there was only one chain of command up through Boeing. It was very difficult for the safety culture to stop something, and, uh, uh, and, and that was a big change. Uh, groupthink was encouraged. Um, being creative in uh, fault, uh, fault tree analysis, thinking about what could go wrong and documenting it and preventing against it. You were encouraged not to be terribly creative or you might have to find another uh, 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 you know, they, they might encourage you to go, you know, find another place to work uh, elsewhere, maybe in the company. So uh, that is our understanding and uh, of, of, uh, of going back to ODA is that dual chain of command. There may be others. Thank you. Anything to add, Mr. Droge? Sorry? Any, any, anything to add, Mr. Droge? Uh, well, yeah, essentially uh, what we are saying with the ODA, um, program, it's that uh, uh, Boeing, uh, Boeing um, uh, has an oversight of itself. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Mr. Graves, recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, when, I, when I gave an opening statement, I talked about statistics. You both being here today and the conversations that we've had make it clear that um, that these aren't statistics, that these are, these are lives, these are family members, and it's something that, that it's, a, it's a message that cannot be overstated to us. Um, again, I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for your strength, I wanna thank you for your, your resilience and your, and your commitment to ensuring that no family has to go through this ever again. Um, and it doesn't matter if we get to 99.9% .9 improvements. Um, if there's one life, if there's one injury, it's, um, we need to keep striving to, to make sure that we get to perfection. And um, I just wanna say it again, um, any process to unground this aircraft, as far as I'm concerned, will not be allowed to resemble the process that was allowed to, um, uh, for, for these accidents to occur. In fact, I can't even call them accidents, these disasters. So. Thank you very much both for being here and I want to remind you that my door is open, my phone's open at any time and I look forward to continuing the dialogue with you. But thank you very much for your recommendations. All right, thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. DeFazio for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Moroge, I read your entire testimony. It's very, very thoughtful, compelling. Uh, and you're an investment professional and 
One of your observations is uh, about uh, the pressures from Wall Street, uh, the concerns regarding uh, how executive compensation is determined on stock price and uh, stock buybacks. Would you like to just comment on that a little bit since you didn't, you, you abbreviated your testimony uh, for oral purposes, which we appreciate, but would you like to uh, perhaps elaborate on that a little bit or sure. at least make that point? Sure, um, thank you. Um, basically, when companies uh, repurchase their own stock, um, they try to send a message out there to the investors that uh, we are bullish about our own company. We believe that our financial performance is, uh, is good. And uh, it seems that um, since the CEO, uh, Dennis Malenberg, obviously before that they still had the uh, equity repurchase program going on, but since he took over, uh, the numbers, the dollar values of uh, the uh, repurchase of, of the stock uh, went up. Um, and, and I do believe it's um, in 2017 when uh, they started selling the 737 Maxes, um, uh, their revenues um, uh, so well, the, the revenues were growing and uh, earnings were growing as well. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they decided, well, we have, uh, um, we have uh, a, a good amount of retained earnings. We can throw the money out there. Um, and uh, the, the stock price, uh, obviously, when you send those, uh, the signaling effect to the Wall Street, uh, the stock price will keep going because you know events, investors will keep buying the stock, and uh, the beneficiaries of this are actually the uh, executives because um, they benefit from uh, equity compensation. Um, that is the exercise of uh, stock options. Um, we also saw uh, them, you know, ha uh, raising their revenues and earnings guidance, and obviously this was based on. Uh, uh, the expectations of uh, the sale of the 737 MAX. Um, we saw them increase dividends. You rarely see a company that increases dividends and at the same time uh, continues to repurchase their own stock. Mm -hmm. When that happens, then the company is so bullish about their, their own uh, uh, um, you know, achievements and uh, they just want their stock to keep going. Um, so let's... That's, thank you for that. Um, so the money that they use for repurchasing, um, it's not uh, constrained in any way. They could spend that money for, on personnel or plant and equipment or anything else. Is that correct? Well, yeah. And, and you know, I really felt that uh, when the board of directors uh, authorized the repurchase of um, stock worth $20 billion, that was in December of 2017, December of 2018, that's just a couple of months ago, about six months ago. Um, that was uh, barely two months after the crash of Lion Air, uh, Flight 610. So at that point, they knew that uh, there were safety concerns with their jet, and uh, they should have um, invested on safety instead of uh, repurchasing stock. Yeah, I recently read a and, and this is something we're looking into, but uh, a news story where they were laying off senior engineers and hiring contractors, uh, some paid less than $10 an hour uh, in dispersed locations around the world, which is obviously hard to supervise and integrate in developing software uh, for this airplane. And that's, uh, when you talk about the amount of money that they had on a discretionary basis that they could use for bonuses, or you know, dividends uh, or you know, buybacks. It, it raises some real concerns. So thank you for thank you for expanding on that. Uh, thank I you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, what uh, we have now going forward is just a few other members have some questions um, for you, and uh, so we're going to go a little out of order uh, in that regard. But um, I know we have Ms. Davids from Kansas, who's the vice chair of the of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member um, of the committee and the and of the full committee. I um, well, first I want to start off by saying thank you to everybody who uh, I know is in the middle of a uh, grieving process right now for.
being here. Um, I, this is an intimidating place to be in general and to take the time to come and force everyone who sits uh, on this committee and all of us who sit in Congress to stop and think about, um, we hear a lot about the stakeholders in this. Uh, the, certainly everyone who gets onto a plane is a stakeholder in this. And um, so your voice is just as important here as, as the people who are in the industry making money and um, running businesses. So I, I appreciate I appreciate you. Um, and Thank you. as someone who's on this committee, I'm very committed to a, a, a thoughtful review of the entire process that's that's going on for us to, um, you know, the responsibility that we have as members of Congress is not just to legislate, but also to perform oversight functions to keep people safe. And um, when I read through your testimony, there are two things I would love to hear um, e both of you sp speak about actually is, um, one, you talked a little bit already about what we should, who we should hear from, that the, the testimony should be from the engineers and from you know executives and whistleblowers and everybody. Um, would, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that in the context of how, how do we make sure that y you have the trust of the industry? Because so much of this is built on trust and this is where we see a breakdown of that trust. The fact that you have to talk about earnings and statements and bringing your professional capacity of understanding that stuff into a conversation that really centers on how do we keep people safe is I, th I think part of the trust conversation. And then the other thing that I, when I read your, when I read your testimony, the fact that you said that Boeing has never reached out to the families really stuck out to me and I would like to hear you comment on that publicly because I think that's really important. Well, um yeah, I'll answer the first, uh, the second question first. Uh, Boeing, uh, um, they've been in front of cameras uh, uh, acknowledging that there were mistakes in the um, installation of MCAS. Um, obviously, they don't talk about the flaws in the designs of, uh, in the design of the 737 MAX. Um, and uh, uh, they've apologized to the families in front of cam cameras. Now, they know uh, who the next of kin of uh, these um, uh, victims are, but uh, they've not come to us and uh, they've not apologized in person. Ethiopian Airlines did send letters to us, not to apologize, but uh, to offer their you know, sympathies and uh, their messages of condolence. Um, so the expectation is, you know, it's hard to trust um, the Boeing, you know, with their apologies, uh, given that uh, they've not reached out to us. And uh, I do believe that they did that in the days leading up to the um, Paris air show, because it's for commercial reasons. I, I believe it's a publicity stunt that they just appeared on cameras to apologize to the families. Yeah, I think the families are in agreement that, that Boeing's uh, uh, apologies to cameras have not been apologies to the families. We were in Ethiopia, our family, after the crash, and the Ethiopian Airlines uh, sent letters, they invited us in, they were reaching out directly, and so it was very much warmer. Uh, and this, the, the recent offer of, you know, uh, 100 million to something seemed like a PR stunt to us. They never reached out to families to discuss what the needs of the families are. And on the future hearings, the, the technical dissenters uh, should be heard from those who dissented from a potential group think force consensus process at FAA, uh, if any, if the committee has identified any, the public should hear them, not just the investigators. Any whistleblowers who may have been uh, uh, fired uh, and uh, 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 maybe have a gag order pursuant to a settlement who have complained about safety issues with regard to the 737 MAX, 
uh, should be called to testify with protective subpoenas so the public can hear what they had to say and what their experience is. And uh, the aviation software uh, 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 writers, uh, do they have the same level of engineering uh, safety uh, culture that uh, regular engineers, aviation safety engineers, were getting more software in these planes? In this case, it took control of the plane and pushed it into the ground. Um, uh, you know, we need triple redundancy in every part of these systems as they merge with, you know, software and hardware. And do the does, do software writers really have that kind of culture? We need to hear who wrote that software and what they have to say and what their culture is. Um, and well, you know, to just to reinforce what Michael said, um, for this committee to have achieved its, its objective, and that objective is to do a data investigation as to what happens with the, uh, what happened within Boeing and the FAA, um, uh, the weakness in their internal oversight processes that um, uh, a jet that is flawed uh, was uh, designed, uh, certified, and uh, allowed to fly. Um, then we need to hear from uh, the technical dissenters, from the whistleblowers, the safety engineers as well. Well, I'll just close by saying thank you again, Mr. Njorge and, and Mr. Stumo for coming here and being the voices um, that are, are sharing with the members of Congress what we need to do to make sure that the trust of the folks who are getting on to planes exists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have just two more members, Mr. Lynch and Ms. Craig. Uh, so I'll call on Mr. Lynch for five minutes from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing, and, and I thank the ranking member as well. Mr. Njoroge, thank you so much for coming here, and, and Mrs. Kumo, for giving, giving voice to your, your loved ones who, can, who cannot speak for themselves. I also want to thank uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Milleron, uh, Nadia, uh, Michael's wife, uh, for spending about an hour with me at the last, after the last hearing and, and talking about her, her daughter, Samia. Uh, I know that Tor and uh, Adnan are here, uh, Samia's brothers, and, and I know that, uh, that uh, Tomra Vesia is here on behalf of her brother, uh, Matt, who also uh, perished. Uh, I want to thank you all for, uh, first of all, being willing to come here and uh, express your, your grief and, and, and trying to hold us all accountable. Owing the FAA and, and Congress uh, for our, our responsibility in this. Um, I also want to thank you for your courage in turning your tragedy, your loss, into something that might benefit the general public thank you. by making this real, by, by, by putting this on us and uh, holding our feet to the fire to make sure that, that we take every step possible to to correct this situation going forward. Uh, in my earlier conversations with, uh, with Nadia, uh, Michael, and, and, uh, and I know this is something that Mr. Njorogi has uh, raised as well. Uh, at our last hearing, we heard from uh, Captain Sullenberger regarding the retraining of, of pilots during the recertification process and once that, that certification process begins, if and when this uh, 737 MAX 8 is allowed to uh, resume flights. And there, there is a controversy or, or some difference of, a, of opinion of whether uh, the training for those pilots or retraining for those pilots should be conducted by simulator or which is what Captain Sullenberger recommended, or whether it should be allowed to occur by a computer, a simple computer program. And uh, I know that, uh, that uh, Nadia had some strong opinion on it. Uh, I think there's a, there's a need to make sure we get this right, and I'm not sure. I know that uh, inadvertently, uh, you have delved into some of the issues. I see some of the recommendations that you've, you've made here in your opening testimony. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the requirement that we 
we, we make sure that uh, in light of the fact that we had reports that the aircraft was acting like a bucking bronco, uh, how important do you think it is that, that we give each and every pilot the full knowledge and experience on a simulator versus allowing them to be retrained on a computer, if you will? Well, uh, first of all, Boeing uh, should never be allowed to um, conceal information uh, from uh, the aviation industry, from uh, uh, the pilots and the, um, the public, because they did that with MCAS. Um, eight days after the crash of Lyon Air Flight 610, they issued a flight operations manual bulletin. And uh, even after knowing that 189 people died, they did not mention MCAS. They did not want to mention the software. Um, and that, that means they were just trying to conceal the information because when you talk of MCAS, then you talk of the uh, design flaws in the 737 MAX. Um, and uh, a lot of times uh, in our lives, we, um, we tend to rely on experiences of other people. Um, and uh, when Captain Solenberg uh, spoke, uh, he said that even knowing that, even he knew that uh, what, he knew what will happen. And so when he was trying to do the simulator uh, thing, um, he, he, he got to understand why the pilots could not control that aircraft. Um, and, and that means that uh, just that iPad training is not enough at all. And um, so, you know, what I would like, uh, the, my recommendation is that uh, the pilots uh, should go through a simulator training uh, and uh, the flight's operations manual should always um, um, disclose everything that is in an aircraft. And, and that should never happen again. I mean, that's criminal. Why would you conceal information of an important uh, software that can take uh, control of the, uh, of the plane? And that's what happened. MCAS took control of that plane, the pilots could not recover it, and they just dived to the ground. So that's, that's something that uh, this committee should look into. Uh, Michael, Steve. Yes, th th thank you for the question. The, you know, this, this plane, we definitely want simulator training as, as families. It was, uh, we, my wife and I came to Washington after Samia's death far earlier than we would ever want to because we heard that the Flight Standardization Board was proposing uh, an, another hour of computer or iPad training as the remedy. Uh, uh, for pilot training after the after our daughter died, and we were very unhappy and worried that there was going to be a rush to unground this plane. Plus, the comment period instead of 30 days was 14 days, and so we um, got involved then, even though we weren't ready to do so. And we had a meeting with FAA early, and we we got families to sign a letter requesting that that comment period be extended so that we could comment and say this is insufficient we need simulator training and the FAA was gracious enough to grant that extension of time to comment and we did and other members of the public submitted comments that simulator training is needed uh, and as captain sullenberger said when you have a a uh, undisclosed or at the very most partially disclosed software system that can take control from the pilots and cause startling things to happen in the cockpit. The simulator, it makes sense to me what he said, that doing the simulator, simulator training is far better than one of many checklists. You have to get it into your muscle memory uh, when those startling things happen and uh, you don't have much time to react. So. Uh, thank you, I thank the chairman for his indulgence. Now you're back. Thank you, I have one more member, it's uh, Ms. Craig from Minnesota, and after she's done, we're just gonna do a five minute transition to the next panel. Uh, so, uh, Representative Craig from Minnesota, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Stumo and Nadia, it's great to see you uh, here again. Thank you for giving me time to speak with you and to talk about how we honor your daughter, Samia's memory, 
with action because that's what um, we need to do. Mr. Uh, Jaroge, I can't imagine the pain that you're enduring with the loss of your wife and your children. But thank you for finding the strength to testify here today. I want to continue focusing on what more we can do to develop those robust post-market, after these planes are out and they're bucking like Broncos, as my colleague said, what more we can do to make sure that we have a robust system for identifying these red flags before crashes occur. I keep wondering how an industry fundamentally rooted in safety can lack robust mandatory reporting requirements by manufacturers, pilots, mechanics, et cetera. In the last hearing, I asked about the Aviation Safety Action Program and the Flight Operations Quality Assurance and whether these operational reporting schemes were catching the mechanical malfunctions or red flags in this country. I also have wondered how Boeing could not be required by law to compile and publish near-miss malfunctions. It's hard to believe that not a single pilot anywhere in the world went head-to-head -head with this malfunctioning MCAS system, overcame the software, landed with information about that experience, and that the public did not know that. I worked for a company that produced pacemakers before I came here that control irregular heart uh, palpitations, machines that by design are there to save lives. Yet we had those kinds of robust reporting requirements. Why don't the airlines and manufacturers? Mr. Jaroge and Mr. Stumo, you testified in support of the FAA creating a system that would require manufacturers, airlines, pilots, and others to develop this kind of early warning system. Um, the industry, though, has advocated in favor of the Aviation Safety Action Program and the Flight Operations Quality Assurance Reporting Systems. Do you think these are currently enough? And what other changes do you think the FAA must incorporate for all parties to be held accountable for putting safety first and make sure adverse events don't go unreported or unnoticed? Thank you for that question. Uh, we as the families, at least my family and others we've talked to, do think that a more robust early warning system is necessary rather than to state, oh, it's been a long time since there's been a crash. That's really good. But if you have a 99.9% .9 safety record, that's one crash every 1,000 flights, which we don't have, but that's not good enough. And I know that in other critical safety industries, or I have heard, I, don't, I am not an expert, that uh, there is that mandatory reporting. There's not only the reporting, but you need a system that can analyze and recognize patterns and then have some uh, ability to get in front of those patterns. And I, I know you've had experience with that in the medical device industry where the, the combination of software and hardware that, that interact and you, you, you and, uh, in, indeed more often the software fails than the hardware. Uh, we have talked to a former administrator of NHTSA who said that there was some sort of an auto mandatory reporting in the auto industry and, a comp uh, and, and, and an analyzing of those records. It may very well be. I don't know that there is a more mature reporting and an analysis on the auto side. I don't know the state of that program right now. But, uh, but there's a lot of information to collect besides GPS data and where, you know, where these planes are. Uh, on, the, on these functions, and you know, for for us, we wish the FAA had had had, had gotten ahead of it, and, and not, uh, you know, I'm I'm sure they're doing their job as you know best they can, but to get, to get ahead of it, and and like uh, like it was said that it was Mr. DeFazio said we don't we now have 346 tombstones if it's a tombstone agency. Let's make some changes, and that's part of it. Thank you, Mr. Jaroga. Do you have anything to add? Not at the moment, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Roge, Mr. Stumo, and uh, the families, um, thank you very much for 
being willing to testify today. I want to commend to the members your written testimony. If everyone has not had a chance to read the written testimony, uh, it's equally compelling. Um, what you've offered us today is not just uh, additional pathways for us as a committee to explore in our oversight. More importantly, um, you're putting a face to what can seem to the outside to be a very bureaucratic, very step-by-step, -step, very incremental investigation. Um, but your presence is a reminder to all of us that um, uh, the flying public, the individuals who get on those airplanes, the families who get on those airplanes are m much more important than, um, than the other folks that we tend to listen to around here. And I appreciate your willingness to spend some time with us uh, to uh, remind us of that. Um, thank you very much. With that, um, the committee will, will excuse you and we'll do a transition for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
we'll get started, I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the second panel. Um, this is Dana Schultz, Acting Director, Office of Aviation Safety of the NTSB, Captain Joe DePete, President of Airline Pilots Association International, Ms. Lori Bassani, National President of the Association of Professional Flight Attendants, Mr. Mike Perone, National President, Professional Aviation Safety Specialist, and Mr. John Samuelson, International President, Transport Workers Union. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we do look forward to your testimony. Um, in my opening statement, I make comments about what I'd like to hear from uh, each of you. And without objection, though, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. And since it, your written testimony has been made, been made part of the record, the subcommittee requests you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. With that, Ms. Schultz, you may now proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Larson, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting the National Transportation Safety Board to testify. I am the Acting Director of the Office of Aviation Safety within the NTSB. First, I would like to express my condolences to the loved ones of those lost in recent aviation disasters. We must learn from their pain and strive to close the gaps in safety that allowed these tragedies to happen. The NTSB is an independent federal agency charged by Congress with investigating every civil aviation accident and certain incidents in the United States and issuing safety recommendations aimed at preventing future accidents. We conduct about 1,400 investigations each year in the last decade, the number of aviation accidents and deaths have declined overall from 539 fatalities in 2009 to 401 in 2018. Nearly 92% were in general aviation. The remainder, primarily Part 135 operations, represent a prominent gap in aviation safety that is on our most wanted list. Currently, air medical, Air taxi, charter, and on-demand operators are not required to meet some of the same safety requirements that have proven effective at enhancing the safety of commercial airline operations. In March, the board completed an investigation of a Part 135 Learjet that crashed in Teterboro, New Jersey. Based on the findings, the NTSB again reiterated recommendations to the FAA require flight data monitoring programs and safety management systems for Part 135 operations. Since completing this investigation, we have initiated another 13 investigations into Part 135 accidents and incidents. The safety issues were not new to the Teterboro accident. The NTSB had ori originally issued these recommendations following a 2015 crash in Akron, Ohio reiterated them following a 2016 accident in Togiak, Alaska, and again following the Teterboro accident. We have also made recommendations to the FAA that aircraft operating under Part 121 and 135 be equipped with a crash-protected cockpit image recording system. These recorders would help focus and expedite investigations and the development of targeted safety recommendations to reduce risk to the traveling public. These recommendations are currently open, unacceptable response. Unfortunately, there are also cases of paying passengers aboard aircraft where the operation is exempt from Part 135. On June 21st, a skydiving flight crashed in Hawaii, killing 11. In March 2018, a sightseeing flight crashed in New York, killing five. Both flights were operating under less stringent Part 91. Regardless of the purpose of the flight or the type of aircraft, commercial aviation should be safe. Our most wanted list also includes strengthening occupant protection. Seat belts and restraints do reduce injury and death. Without their use, preventable deaths will continue to occur. We have recommended that the FAA require all general aviation airplanes be retrofitted with sh shoulder harnesses. The FAA has not required them on aircraft manufactured before 1986 for economic reasons. This recommendation was closed unacceptable action. This week marks the 30th anniversary of the United Flight 232 crash in Sioux City, Iowa, where 111 were killed and 172 injured. 
Four infants were on board that aircraft. In preparation for the emergency landing, all were held by adults as instructed by the crew. The forces were too great. All were ejected from the adult's grip and injured, one fatally. We recommended the FAA prohibit children from being lap held on commercial flights. Children are safest when they are properly secured in their own seat. Even when occupants use appropriate restraints, inadequate evacuation procedures can also other cause otherwise survivable crashes to turn fatal. Evidence of passengers retrieving carry-on baggage during recent emergency evacuations demonstrates that previous actions to mitigate this potential safety hazard have not been effective. We recommended the FAA develop best practices through an industry working group for evacuation. This recommendation is currently open on acceptable response. Last, another area of concern for emerging transportation technologies, such as unmanned aircraft and commercial space systems operations. The NTSB continues to grow its expertise in both areas, completing our first commercial space investigation in 1993 and first investigation of a mid-air collision between an aircraft and a drone in 2016. As the number of these operations grow, it is inevitable, inevitable that the need for our investigations will too. We continue our focus in these areas and appreciate this committee's commitment to ensuring we have the resources to proactively be ready to advance safety into the future. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss the work that the NTSB is doing to make transportation safer. There continues to be room for improvement and the NTSB stands ready to work with you to improve the safety of our nation's aviation systems for all users. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Captain Pete, you're recognized for five minutes. Yes, good morning. Um, thank you, Chairman DeFazio from the full committee and Ranking Member Graves, Sam Graves, and also uh, Chairman Larson and Ranking Member Garrett Graves uh, and the subcommittee members. On behalf of the 62,000 pilots that I represent at 34 airlines in the United States and Canada, I wish to express our sincere condolences to the loved ones of the victims of the Ethiopian Airlines and, and Ryanair accidents. We cannot know the depth of your grief, but we can share in your determination to leave a legacy of safety improvements for those you have lost. As a 40-year pilot, the highest standards of safety have been at the forefront of my flying career. As president of the Airline Pilots Association, the world's largest non-governmental aviation safety organization, I could tell you that all pilots, all airline pilots, share this dedication. While airline accidents are rare, even one fatal accident is one too many. Over the years, ALPA has helped develop an investigation process to identify all the contributing factors, evaluate needed changes, and most importantly, implement those changes to improve safety. The results include the first officer qualification experience and training requirements that emerge from the Kogan 3407 investigation. These requirements are a major reason why the U.S. industry has not experienced a pilot training or operational related fatality on a U.S. passenger airline in more than 10 years. And this is why ALPA has called upon the International Civil Aviation Organization to set global pilot standards. But incredibly, even when safety improvements like these are codified in law, thanks to many of you here in this room today, some still seek to undermine them. While we've made strides, we have more to do. ALPA will continue to help identify improvements, not only during these investigations, but also in the long term through the industry's risk-predictive, data-driven approach to enhancing safety. We will never stop fighting against those who put profits before the safety of our passengers, cargo, and crew. Our safety commitment means that ALPA will be fully involved in understanding what went wrong and evaluating how to move forward with the Boeing 737 MAX once the FAA final review is complete. We've made clear that questions must be answered in the areas of oversight, aircraft certification, and delegation of authority. ALPA will work tirelessly to ensure that industry 
and government make the changes necessary to safeguard our system. Equally important, our industry must be more determined than ever to prevail against special interests that would have us ignore the lessons from the past. For example, we must deliver on Congress's intent to install secondary barrier, flight deck barriers on all newly manufactured passenger aircraft, a lesson we all learned from the 9-11 report. And we still have work to do to achieve one level of aviation safety by applying science-based flight, duty, and rest requirements to pilots like myself who fly cargo and mandating intrusion-resistant flight deck doors on cargo aircraft. Likewise, our industry must continue to make improvements to safeguard the shipment of dangerous goods and lithium batteries and eliminate shipments of undeclared dangerous goods. Today, ALPA released a new report that lays out the indisputable safety benefits of the presence of at least two fully qualified, adequately rested, and highly trained pilots on the flight deck. We, knew, we know, as do our passengers, that the presence of at least two pilots on board our airliners not only contributes to a proactive, risk-predictive safety culture, it's the reason why U.S. air transportation is so safe today. The importance of a strong safety culture is one reason that ALPA opposes allowing foreign airlines with flag of convenience business models to serve the United States. These schemes create an unstable work environment for employees that can discourage proactive safety reports. I commend Chair DeFazio, Aviation Subcommittee Chair Larson, Vice Chair Davids, and Representative Davis, and this subcommittee for supporting legislation to enable the Department of Transportation to determine whether airlines using these harmful business practices should fly to the United States. The House included a similar provision in the, in the recent FAA reauthorization, and I hope the Fair and Open Skies Act will move quickly. And to finish, as pilots, our priority is always safety. We make certain our industry learns from the tragedies we see, and we make improvements. Whether it's the decision on the return to service of the Boeing 737 MAX, or to take off on every flight, it is safe to fly when the pilots in command says it is. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bassani, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman DeFazio, Chairman Larson, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the Aviation Subcommittee. My name is Lori Bassani, and I'm the President of the Association of Professional Flight Attendants. First, I'd like to extend my deepest condolences to Mr. Jiroge, Mr. Stuko, and all of the families who were impacted by the Ethiopian Air and Lion Air crashes. Their testimony was very compelling and heartfelt. APFA represents over 28,000 flight attendants of American Airlines and is the largest independent flight attendant union in the world. APFA is also a member of the Coalition of Flight Attendants, where labor organizations that represent virtually all U.S.-based flight attendants come together to promote aviation safety and our profession. Today, I'm the proud to be the voice for the nearly 100,000 flight attendants across the nation. I know many of you on this committee travel each week and personally understand the challenges of air travel today. Believe me, we feel your frustrations. As both first responders on board the aircraft and the last line of defense, should the unthinkable happen again, your safety and security is our top priority. The 2018 FAA reauthorization bill included many safety improvements that we are all eager to see implemented and that need the continuing oversight of this important committee. We applaud the passage of this bill with overwhelming bipartisan support. It's a genuine tribute to leadership of this committee and the importance of these issues. There are several safety provisions I would like to speak to today. First, in Section 337, the FAA is instructed to review cabin evacu evacuation procedures and the changes to passenger seating configurations. Stop. In the time that I've been speaking, it's been 90 seconds, my crew would be charged with evacuating a full aircraft with 291 lives aboard. I hope that we saved all of those lives, but here are some of the ways that we can do this. 
APFA has previously testified regarding our concerns on seat size, pitch, and our ability to evacuate an aircraft using just half of the exits in 90 seconds or less. This is the certification requirement mandated by the FAA. The truth is that passengers are now older, some are larger, and sometimes less mobile. As seat size and legroom continue to shrink, frustrations rise. We are seeing unprecedented levels of air rage. In an emergency landing, passengers no longer have enough space to assume the proper brace position. Under these conditions, is a 90-second evacuation still realistic? APFA believes that a comprehensive review of, of evacuation procedures under real-world conditions is long overdue. Second, the FAA recognizes that toxic fumes jeopardize flight safety, but has no process to collect reports from crew and no procedures to investigate such incidents. This means that the true extent of toxic fume contamination remains largely unknown. Last year, at our airline alone, 1,500 fume events were reported to our safety department. My members have been hospitalized and have suffered chronic and permanent neurological damage. Section 326 of the FAA bill takes first steps in addressing this issue by requiring the collection data and providing educational information to crew members. The Cabin Air Safety Act, introduced this year by Congressman Garamendi, specifically mentions carbon monoxide detectors and takes the FAA bill a needed step further, and we urge its adoption. Third, Congress amended the minimum flight attendant rest requirement from eight to 10 hours. When Congress passed this legislation, the intent was clear. Simply modify the 1994 rule relating to flight attendant rest within 30 days of passage. Sounds simple, makes common sense, but apparently not. We are now hearing from the DOT and the FAA that it will take months to implement this modest change. Given the broad bipartisan support of this provision, we ask that the committee re-engage and insist on its timely implementation. Lastly, we want to thank the committee for your work providing oversight on the 737 MAX tragedies. When the aircraft regains flight status, we will be the ones in the aisles reassuring our passengers. Flight attendants must have absolute confidence in the aircraft and in the process that will return it to service. We continue to look to you to ensure that that process is fully transparent. As flight attendants, safety is in our DNA. On any given flight, on any given day, we can be called upon to attend to a heart attack victim, to fight fires, to avert security risks, to comfort a child traveling alone, to de-escalate enraged passengers, identify sex traffickers, and deal with turbulence and delays, all while being prepared to evacuate a plane stuffed full of passengers at a moment's notice within 90 seconds. We need to know and be able to communicate to the traveling public our guests, that we have and will continue to have the safest aviation system in the world. Thank you. My testimony is now complete. Thank you. I now recognize uh, my prone for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman DeFazio, Chairman Lawson, Ranking Member Graves, and the members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify on behalf of the professional aviation safety specialist to discuss the current state of aviation safety. While the United States remains the world leader in aviation, PASS agrees with the subcommittee that it is time to examine all factors that influence aviation safety. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the family members here today who lost their loved ones in the Ethiopian Airlines accident. On behalf of all members of PASS, I extend our deepest condolences to you and to the families of the Lion Air victims who also suffered great loss. PASS represents approximately 11,000 FAA employees nationwide. These employees are the backbone of the aviation system. Technical operations employees install, maintain, support, and certify air traffic control equipment. Aviation safety inspectors, or ASIs, oversee and inspect commercial and general aviation. PASS represented employees also develop flight procedures, perform quality analysis of aviation systems used in air traffic control, and aid in building and restoring air traffic control facilities. 
When I last appeared before the subcommittee, it was in the wake of the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. ASIs and support personnel were furloughed and no longer providing safety oversight, while technicians, TSA agents, and others worked without pay. Layers of safety were being stripped away. Unfortunately, we find ourselves approaching a similar situation without a funding agreement in sight. It is imperative to the integrity and safety of the national airspace system that Congress and the White House work to avoid another shutdown. The uncertainty of the current political environment also threatens the FAA's ability to attract and retain the highly skilled workforce that it requires. Staffing and training challenges have plagued the FAA for years. Within air traffic, inadequate technician staffing at critical airports across the country remains a challenge, resulting in increased restoration times during an outage and more air traffic delays. Staffing shortages can also put FAA employees at risk. The safety of the system starts with the safety of all FAA employees. The agency does not even know how many employees are adequately needed to perform safety critical work. For example, this committee saw fit to include in the provision of the 2018 FAA reauthorization, directing the FAA to re-examine the ASI staffing model. However, it remains unclear when this work will be completed. ASIs are vital to the FAA certification processes that ensure aircraft and equipment that meet FAA airworthiness requirements. Past represented employees and flight standards issue certificates and approvals for commercial air carriers, repair stations, pilot, and others to operate in the NAS. While the FAA inspectors are integral to the certification process, individuals and ODAs are often granted more authority to conduct certification functions traditionally performed by FAA inspectors. Designees are now performing more than 90% of the FAA certification activities, despite serious concerns by the Inspector General and past that oversight is lacking. While the delegation of this authority may be deeply integrated into the certification process, now is the time to make sure that the FAA is providing the proper oversight of the program to ensure its success moving forward. Unfortunately, after the two tragic accidents that led to the grounding of the 737 MAX and with the agency facing intense scrutiny, the FAA continues to rapidly expand the delegation program, further removing ASI oversight from the certification process. PASS has urged the FAA to halt further expansion of delegation until the investigations relating to the 737 MAX are issued and would appreciate the committee's support on this matter. This is but one example where risk is continually being introduced into the system that may not manifest itself for years to come. I'd also like to highlight the work performed overseas on U.S. aircraft at foreign repair stations. Domestically, FAA inspectors perform unannounced inspections of repair facilities. However, foreign facilities receive announced inspections, giving those facilities advance notice to ensure compliance before inspectors arrive. Foreign facilities should be subject to the same requirements as domestic repair stations. No other technology will alter the makeup of our airspace like the integration of drones. With over a million drones registered, the agency is facing a new set of safety, staffing, and training challenges. As drones are now sharing airspace with manned aircraft, ASIs and aviation safety technicians are tasked with ensuring the safe operation and compliance with federal regulations. Past fears that similar to the many other areas of aviation safety, FAA employees will be forced to oversee this booming industry without the proper guidance and training. It shouldn't take a tragedy before the agency recognizes and re reconsiders this approach. In closing, PASS emphasizes that the safety of our airspace starts and ends with the investments in the employees who oversee and maintain it. Any, anything short of that is simply gambling, gambling with aviation safety. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify on this important issue, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. We now recognize uh, Mr. Samuelson for five minutes. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Chairman DeFazio, Chairman Lawson, and Ranking Member Graves for holding this hearing today. My name is John Samuelson, International President of the Transport Workers Union, representing over 150,000 members in the USA and the Caribbean. In the aviation industry, our members work as mechanics, flight attendants, ramp workers, pilot instructors, airline dispatchers, 
and fleet service workers. Frontline aviation workers are responsible for maintaining our air safety and security system. We often have the best view of airline safety gaps, so giving all of us the opportunity to share our experience and recommendations is very important. Today, I'd like to highlight two important safety issues. Legally, the FAA requires that all U.S. flagged commercial aircraft be maintained to the same standard. However, the FAA has actually exempted maintenance work done outside the United States from many safety standards. The result is now a two-tier system, a two-tier safety system that encourages airlines to offshore more and more work, introducing more and more risk into our aviation system. Foreign repair, foreign repair stations are exempt from regulations requiring mandatory security and background checks for workers, risk-based safety and security evaluations for facilities, drug and alcohol testing, unannounced FAA inspections, and FAA certification standards for mechanics and technicians. Congress has already directed the FAA and the DOT to address several of these safety gaps twice in the past decade. Compliance with these mandates are years overdue. FAA delays led to a boom for foreign repair stations. The number of these facilities has grown by more than 30% in just the past four years. There are now more than 900 FAA certified foreign repair stations, including 200 that have been approved since 2017. The amount of maintenance work being performed at these stations with lower safety standards is already extremely high with coordinated efforts underway right now to increase those numbers. DOT data shows that three leading U.S. airlines, that the three leading U.S. airlines, all sent about 30% of their maintenance work to foreign facilities. U.S. mechanics, technicians, and pilots are increasingly alarmed by the incompetent work and often nefarious actions performed on aircraft outside of the United States of America. Their discoveries have included critical engine components held together with tape and wire, mid-flight cabin depressurization caused by incorrectly installed exterior door parts, aircraft covered with flammable paint, drug smuggling in aircraft noses, wheel wells, avionics, and laboratory panels. The country with the most FAA-certified foreign repair stations is China, and that, represented, that represents significant cyber and other security questions. This unlevel playing field for safety regulations is also costing American jobs. More than 8,200 aircraft maintenance jobs left the country in recent years. The job loss is caused by regulatory loopholes that allow airlines to cut costs by diminishing safety. We often hear that airlines do not compete on safety, but right now, that's exactly what they're doing. Congress and the administration have to live up to this ideal by immediately closing all the loopholes that encourage moving this important maintenance work outside of the country. I'd also like to highlight another problem, which was just touched on by President Bassani, um, and that's cabin air quality. The atmosphere surrounding aircraft at 40,000 feet above sea level is too thin to breathe. So modern aircraft heat air from around the wings and over the engines and then compress that air before circulating it into the cabin. These nerve agents are absorbed by both inhalation and through the skin. Repeated or prolonged exposure to these agents, like that endured every day by flight attendants and frequent air travelers, can have devastating health effects. These incidents are being reported more and more often now because of rising public awareness and because of trade union advocacy. Just three days ago, a commercial plane made an emergency landing because of a fume event that made passengers and crew alike sick. Aircraft aren't even equipped with sensors to alert the crew when fume events are occurring. This makes reporting and responding to these events extremely difficult. I want to say thanks to Representatives John Garamendi and Pete Stauber for introducing the Cabin Air Safety Act. It directly addresses the health and safety concerns presented by these toxic fume events. The TW fully endorses this legislation, and we hope the committee will take action on it soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Again, looking forward to questions. 
Thank you, uh, President Samuelson. Um, thank you everyone for your testimony today. We're gonna move down to member questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes and I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes. My first question is for Ms. Schultz, the NTSB. Uh, with regards to emerging technologies and the uh, need for growing expertise at the NTSB to match the um, use of the airspace, uh, does NTSB have a plan to develop that expertise? And if not, uh, what's your plan to develop the plan um, for that expertise? Well, thank you for your, for your question, Chairman Larson. Um, we do have a plan with regard to drone, um, drones in the aerospace and in the na national airspace system. Um, we have, since uh, our first investigation of a drone accident back in 2006, been looking at this issue very seriously. We recognized at that time that this this new segment of the industry was coming. In 2010, we actually changed our regulation to address uh, unmanned aircraft systems in our rule. Uh, we added UAS accident in our accident definition in our regulation. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, we also issued guidance to the industry for reporting standards to help them understand what's reportable to us. Um, and so we have also continued along that line by having a specialist identified, an expert internally within our organization who has um, helped us develop our uh, investigative protocols for investigating drone accidents. Um, as I mentioned, in 2016, we investigated our first uh, drone mid-air collision with an aircraft, a helicopter uh, over New York City, or I'm sorry, in, uh, near Staten Island. And so um, we are very interested and very engaged in that technology, and we do appreciate the committee's support in helping us get there. Yeah, and your investigation protocol, is it, um, is it uh, drone on anything, or is it drone on aircraft, aircraft on drone, or is it drone on drone? So our reporting what, what, standard... Yeah, what do you care? Yeah, sure. What, what nope, that's care a, that's that? a, a very good question. Um, we do not investigate hobbyists, so um, we are looking more, we're focused more on those operators who are uh, certified under one of the FAA requirements. Um, but in terms of our, our uh, accident definition, any, uh, any UAS accident involved um, that would result in a serious injury would be considered an accident, no matter what the size of the drone. If there's not an injury involved, but there's substantial damage, it's for drones that are 300 pounds or greater. Probably maybe have further questions later. Uh, President uh, Perrone, uh, there's an ongoing debate on whether the FAA is uh, uh, adequately including the aviation safety inspectors in the certification process, particularly those overseeing ODA. Um, how do safety inspector staffing challenges impact your members currently, uh, and then the and then the traveling public as well? So the problem that we have, uh, past believes that the, the FAA doesn't ha have enough inspectors. They don't have um, the staffing and also training to keep up with it. The ODA program is expanding, like I said, more than um, the FAA can, can handle it. And we just want the FAA to be able to understand they need to have the oversight available. We understand industry has the expertise. They are going to do what they need to do. but. Bottom line for FAA, the regulatory side of the house, they have to have enough inspectors with the knowledge to understand what's going on and if they're gonna sign off on the, on the ODA program, they have to be there. The FAA's position right now is they're data collectors. So the, our inspectors used to go out, kick the tires, visit the aircraft the, in, in industry and see and have a rapport with the, with the industry as well as, as the folks working on the equipment. They've changed that philosophy, they have and rely on the industry giving data to the FAA, and our inspectors just look at that data and then sign off. That's not, a, again, a good position to be in. Um, and with the government shutdown during that time frame, industry kept rolling, and our inspectors were sitting at home because they were furloughed. So all that backlog work, plus their normal work once they came back, was a, a rush to get everything done. Things could fall through the cracks. So given staffing issues and training issues and combining that with these emerging technologies in the airspace, are you, are you changing how you train incoming inspectors uh, to address issues like drones or the commercial space transportation issues? Or um, how, how is the training changing? 
So we're trying to get the FAA to, to work on the training issues as well. One of the things that we tried also, we twice put in for the Drone Advisory Committee, and the DOT um, did not uh, put pass on there. Again, our folks represent the inspectors who are going to end up ultimately overseeing the regulation. We've asked the FAA why we were not included. They said DOD, excuse me, DOT made the decision, so we've asked, can we get a response? Um, so we agree training needs to be modified and changed, and since it's a permissible subject, the agency can or not include us. Thank you. Uh, turn to uh, Ranking Member Graves for five minutes. Great, right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it, and I want to thank all of you for your, for your testimony today. Uh, Captain DePete, the, the, earlier today there were, there were calls for more proactive early warning system uh, type program to be put together to identify um, in any uh, safety concerns associated with, with aircraft. Um, could you explain right now, I, I think pilots are stakeholders in this as well, uh, can you explain right now what type of system is provided for that allows for that type of reporting to, uh, to, to bubble up? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for the question, uh, Ranking Member Graves. Um, you know, back uh, in 1997, 98 time period when after a series of major accidents occurred and the commercial air safety team was formed, very aggressive data collection effort became underway, where measurements of over 150 streams of data come in with the, the ASAP program, the Aviation Safety Action Programs are inclusive, and the focal program, the Flight Ops Quality Assurance was also included in that. And then very soon after, we saw four uh, accidents occur, culminating with Colgan. And that led to taking a look at completing the circle and looking at the way pilots were trained, we instituted, thanks to the work of these, this committee, uh, flight time and duty time regulations, although cargo was carved out ultimately, as you know, um, not uh, always looking for one level of safety. But that led to the safest period in aviation history in America, where I can say that we've moved close to three quarters of the world's population in metal composite tubes in the lowest stratosphere without a single pilot caused fatality, with the exception of the one Southwest aircraft that had the fan blade. And so it is my belief here that the absence of accidents is, is a wonderful thing, but it's all the more important that we remain diligent and committed to safety to look more and more into how we can better report. We've, we've got a strong, resilient system right now, a very robust system. It's working. Um, although. Obviously, we're here today, and we heard from some of the families behind me. Something happened that wasn't supposed to happen. We, many years ago, uh, like I said, we had a forensic approach where we, the tombstone uh, uh, mentality that you mentioned, uh, Chairman DeFazio, and now we have a risk predictive model. So it's very important, like I said in my testimony, that we examine closely the certification, the oversight, and the designation authority and find out how we can make this better. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Prone, in your, in your testimony, you, um, you discuss federal regulations for the type of, of uh, certification uh, process. And, and so right now, um, who, who is it that establishes the certification basis uh, for um, the, the safety standard, including safety standards that, that have to be met in, in order for an aircraft to, to um, proceed? So the regulation is done by the FAA, and then okay. the industry has to follow that, whatever they come up with. For okay, regulation. and then who establishes the, the certification plan and um, the, the means of compliance and the, and the level of, of FAA uh, involvement in, in the verification process? So again, I think it, it, the industry, Boeing or whoever, comes up with a plan on how to do it, and the, the FAA oversees that, that procedure. So wait, wait a minute. You, you're... You're saying that the FAA, excuse me, that Boeing or the manufacturer would actually come up with a certification plan, including the means of compliance and the, and the uh, level of FAA involvement? It, it, they come up with, again, their engineering, they do all the studies, they do what they need to do, then the FAA makes sure that that complies with the regulation, complies with the system, and then they have, once they do it, and once they build the aircraft or whatever the particular certification piece is, 
that they're following that compliance. So you're saying that the companies actually established a certification plan? They're the ones that, correct, they're the ones that know the best way to come up with that uh, engineering design, I, I, and then the FAA oversees it. I, 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 I don't think that's accurate, and I'm very anxious to hear from the, from the FAA on, on actually who the, the, that certification process. Um, and, then, and then lastly, who is it that actually verifies that, that all of the requirements have been met in the type of certification that's issued? So just to clarify, the FAA procedure, the certification procedure, if I said it, miss said it, um, they come up with a plan, this is what you need to do, the engineers build that, and then the FAA oversees that to make sure they followed it. I just, I was, I was concerned because you, you, you noted in your testimony, while investigations are ongoing, what we do know is the FAA has delegated primary oversight of the MAX to Boeing, and I was concerned about that because I, I'm, I'm concerned that might have left folks with a, a different understanding than, than I have in regard to the process that, or the role that FAA plays versus the manufacturer, and I'm not sure that FAA would, would concur, and I, I just wanted to make yeah, sure I we clarify. Yeah, I is what I was trying to come up with. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Before recognizing Chair DePazio for five minutes, I ask unanimous consent that the following item be entered into the record of today's hearing, a letter from the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA, regarding uh, child uh, restraint. With that objection, so ordered. Chair recognizes Chair DePazio for five minutes. Uh, I thank the Chair. Uh, to Mr. Perone, Mr. Samuelson, uh, you both raised the issue, uh, Mr. Perone raised the issue that the FAA cannot uh, go to foreign repair stations with no prior notice and that you know, we're not properly overseeing them. They, they aren't subject to drug testing, alcohol testing, background checks, et cetera. And, and then, uh, Mr. Samuelson, you talked about the flood of uh, work to these overseas. And I'd just like both of you to comment on this. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, there are no commercial flights, uh, you know, to the United States from El Salvador. Uh, yet airlines are taking empty planes to El Salvador uh, for maintenance and repairs. Um, this causes some concern to me. I mean, either of you want to comment on that? Yeah, I would say that um, USA flagged carriers that perform work in El Salvador, particularly where they fly empty planes there, to have maintenance done. There's only one reason for that. and. The reason, well, there's, they've been permitted to do it by the FAA, but the only reason for that is, is the pursuit of profit. There's no other reason for that. They're certainly not sending planes to El Salvador because the work is done safer in El Salvador than it is on the United States soil. You listed a few pretty disturbing examples of uh, poor overseas maintenance work. Right. I mean, we, so, so there's plenty of those, but one specific example is April 5th, 2018, a plane uh, that was serviced in South America came into Chicago O'Hare and TW Mechanics found vital engine components that were held together with duct tape, um, that duct tape that was applied in, on foreign soil um, by non-certified mechanics. That's just one example. There are other examples as well that we can provide the committee in the, after this testimony. We, we would love uh, to have those examples. I've been on this issue for years. Mr. Brown, you want to comment on your concerns about this? Well, I just think it's, it goes along the same lines. We used to, the FAA used to have uh, inspectors in different locations overseas, and they closed those offices down, brought them back to the United States for money-saving purposes. But in the, in the end, we believe if they were there, if they were in different locations, if they're going to continue moving uh, the work overseas that the inspector should be available to, to do oversight inspection. Um, we agree with our uh, brothers in, in TWU as well that the work should be done in the United States. I think we got the greatest uh, country in the world to see and do the oversight and why not keep it here? Okay. Um, and uh, Ms. Bassani and uh, Ms. Schultz, you both raised issues about um, cabin evacuation and, and we mandated their, the procedures be reviewed. Can you give us a quick update on where NTSB is on that? Uh, yes, thank you for your question. Um, 
we have made recommendations um, on a variety of, of areas for evacuation, and one particular was to ask the FAA to form uh, a committee, a group, to, um, to look closer at communication protocols uh, between the cockpit, the cabin. Um, and at this point, um, the uh, recommendation is open on acceptable action. But we are uh, committed to continuing that communication with the FAA on the cabin safety side. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bassani, you, you raised the issue uh, about uh, the length of time for one particular uh, evacuation and problems with it and carry-on bags and all that. Could you just give us what? And you also raised uh, the issue of uh, seat pitch and width. And, you know, of course, I, I mean, are you witnessing the people having trouble getting in and out of those ever narrower and closer together seats? Thank you for that question, Chairman DeFazio. First of all, I want to thank you for the seat I'm in today because it's a lot more comfortable than what I flew down here Someday in. Someday I'm going to get the airline <laughs> execs all lined up there, and I'm going to bring in the narrowest coach seats I can find. And we're going to keep them there for a few hours. You know, I think it's torture. And I'll tell you, from experience, crossing my legs in one of those seats and for a passenger in front of me to lean their seat back quickly, I think I almost got a broken kneecap mm -hmm. the other day. But it's, it's distressing to see our passengers smashed into these airplanes now. As you know, it never used to be this way. As flight attendants, a lot of times what we like to do to accommodate our passengers who might be taller or bigger, we like to move them to a seat that's more accommodating, which is a lot of times up at the bulkhead or by the emergency exits. However, now that the airlines are charging more for those premium seats, we can no longer do that. So we find that the seats are not only getting smaller, but there's no padding on them anymore. It's, it is a torture chamber for our customers and for us that also fly in our own airlines. Uh, I, I commend you so much for, for addressing that in this committee, and we, we were so pleased to hear that that's being addressed. Seat pitch is extremely important, mainly for evacuating the aircraft. The passengers already, in, in the normal case of getting on or off the airplane, are having difficult times getting into the aisle to sit down. Can you imagine, in a stressful situation, trying to evacuate in a real life scenario, passengers from a plane that is burning or that is you know, half tilted or upside down? Listen, these people are having a hard enough time, like I said, getting in and out in a normal process but in an evacuation, it's gonna be almost impossible. So that's an extremely, extremely important provision for us. Thank you for that question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Perry, I'm calling you for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Earliest, earlier this month, the FAA announced that it has again delayed the publication of its notice of proposed, proposed rulemaking on remote ID and tracking for UAS, a rulemaking required by the 2016 FAA reauthorization. According to the FAA, the NPRM will now be published in September after the agency acknowledged it would fail to fulfill the congressional mandate by its July deadline. FAA's track record throughout this process offers us little optimism that the new deadline will be realized, but the importance of the issue demands their immediate action. It's my understanding that Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and Ranking Member Graves expressed their concerns to Secretary Chow in a letter earlier this month. I appreciate this effort and I share their concerns about the safety implications of continuing to operate without the remote ID and tracking system in place. By its inaction, FAA is failing to mitigate significant significant potential threats to the safety of the flying public. I'd also like to highlight the impact of FAA's inaction on our global competitiveness in this up and coming industry. Every day, the bureaucrats at FAA are unable or unwilling to do their job. We cede more of our technological, technological advantage to our industry, uh, in this industry, to our international competitors, friends and foe alike. Uh, Ms. Schultz, obviously, uh, this is in your wheelhouse, so I want to offer you a, a, an opportunity to just, uh, to just respond, but I'd also like to hear from the other members on the panel uh, their thoughts about whether this uh, drone identification uh, increases or decreases the safety of, in the aviation industry and the flying public, and if waiting another two years for this cr critical rulemaking to be finalized in the interest of the aviation community from either a safety or competitive standpoint 
is, uh, is a good idea. Well, thank you for your question. Um, at this time, based on the investigative work we've done, we've not identified that. We don't have a position on that issue. Um, I think we work very closely with the FAA and the drone industry. We, uh, we do act as observers on the drone advisory group to understand where these different technologies are going. And I think what we are trying to do is ensure that we are prepared to investigate accidents that might be uh, caused in part by those type of deficiencies. So um, that's where our focus is right now. Thank you. Chair Representative Petteri, great question. I actually was going to try to integrate that into my comments here today. Um, I'm as frustrated as well because uh, I, the Airline Pilots Association has an unwavering commitment to safety, uh, and we have been part of the progress, process of the introduction of UAS into our national airspace system. And like any user of the airspace system, we want it to be safe. And I, we certainly recognize the socioeconomic benefits uh, to, to drones, it's a fascinating technology and, and we support it, but we support the safe integration. So the delay is not, is not a good thing in my view. We have, a, we have an opportunity here to do it right the first time. Um, I shudder at the day that I, I hear about the accident when a drone gets sucked into an engine and you know, two well-trained, well-rested, experienced pilots safely get it on the ground. Let's hope that's the outcome. Um, but what really uh, adds fuel to the fire on this particular issue is that ID and tracking, which we were a part of those aviation mode making committees, are foundational uh, technologies that are going to be necessary for the safe integration. So, um, yes, we've, we, we work very closely with all our, our regulators, and uh, we are going to uh, consistently uh, compel them to move the process along quickly, but we can certainly use help. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Director Schultz, what is the U.S. aviation safety record over the last three decades and how does it compare to the rest of the world, if you know? Well, I, I can say that, um, as I mentioned in my statement, um, over the, the last decade, um, it has improved in terms of the numbers. Um, we're always looking at the individual factors involved in accidents, and we think that safety um, is something that one must always be vigilant, no matter what the numbers are reflecting. Um, I don't have three decades worth of data with me, and we would be absolutely happy to follow up with you after the hearing on that data. Um, but I would just reinforce that um, the numbers do tell one side of the story, but it's critically important, as I think some of the other witnesses have testified, to be um, proactive in understanding these issues uh, as they manifest through some of the voluntary reporting programs and in terms of our role under accident investigations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Chair, I yield. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cohen. You have five minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I presume some of the, I know they are, but I appreciate the relatives testifying, very courageous. And compelling testimony. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I was here, but I had to go to another hearing. Airplane safety is so important, and in, in that those crashes, it was death. And it's a serious matter, and the public deserves the right to know when decisions to increase profit margins have an impact on their health and safety. With the MCAS, and that happened, but it all happens in other places as well. Federal law requires that planes be capable of being evacuated within 90 seconds of an emergency. That's federal law. With half the aircraft exists inoperable. With half the aircraft exits inoperable. There have been several recent occurrences that raise questions of whether all passengers on an aircraft can indeed evacuate within 90 seconds. In 2016, the NTSB concluded that it took at least 2 minutes, 21 seconds, 51 seconds longer over half the time longer than the FAA uh, assumes is the correct time for 161 passengers to evacuate a lightly loaded American Airlines flight. In January 2018, the NTSB concluded that evidence of passengers retrieving carry-on baggage during this and other recent emergency evacuations demonstrates that previous FAA actions to mitigate this potential safety hazard have not been effective. This should concern everybody. It's not the same as a plane falling out of the sky. But when a plane does have an emergency and they land and people can't get off in time, injuries and deaths occur. 
They're preventable. Emergency evacuation is a serious issue, as is the potential for air rage as tensions mount inside more tightly packed cabins. Doctors have warned that deep vein thrombosis can affect passengers, afflict them who don't move their legs during longer flights. Despite this, seat sizes continue to shrink, and the seat sizes shrink not on their own, but because the airlines want to pack more people in. They want to have emulate sardines in an airplane. They pack people in in their sides, in front. You can't cross your legs. You can't get out. That's why Representatives Kinzinger and I introduced Seat Egress and Air Travel, or the SEAT an, an acronym, that requires the FAA to review cabin evacuation procedures and issue regulations establishing minimum dimensions for passenger seats necessary for the safety of passengers. Pleased it was in the FAA reauthorization bill. Great work. Nine months since it passed into law, and it appears very little action has taken place. This is something that could save lives, and in nine months since the Congress said do it, nothing has apparently been done. Ms. Is it Schultz? Eh? Schultz. Schultz. You're the acting director of Office of National Safety, National Transportation Safety Board. As mentioned in Mr. Bassani's testimony, it appears zero action has taken place on implementation of the SEED Act. Has the FAA begun working with the NTSB on implementation of the SEED Act? Well, thank you for your question. We have been contacted by the FAA, but uh, I would say that there's additional conversations that is, is going to ensue. Um, I think it's at the planning stage would, would be our assessment, but we have been contacted. And, and after nine months after Congress said to do it, and lives are in the balance, and you're in the conversation stage, hello, how are you? I'm here at the University of Michigan as a freshman. Nice to meet you. Don't you think you ought to take some action by now? Well, certainly the FAA requirement that, uh, that was in the legislation is, is clear. Um, we have made a number of recommendations, and we continue to work uh, proactively with FAA to have those implemented. Uh, but from our standpoint, we are remaining fully open and ready to receive that uh, work with FAA. Can I ask you to try to call them and urge them to start to act on behalf of the flying public? We absolutely, on a routine basis, interact with them to promote and advocate for those recommendations, for our recommendations. Thank you. Ms. Bassani, in your t written testimony, you discussed the importance of the SEED Act and how important it is for FAA to review cabin evacuation procedures. Can you expand on why the implementation is so important and how a new review of cabin evacuation procedures could possibly affect your members? Thank you for the question, Congressman Cohen. First of all, I want to thank you for spearheading that act. It's one of the single most important things that flight attendants find that we need right now and that our passengers need. Safety is so important. And like I said earlier, safety's in our DNA. It's so important that we enact, that we enact this soon, sooner rather than later, because if the airlines are smashing seats into these airplanes. Come on, and when I talk to them as the president of my union and say, this is ridiculous, we have a seat right up on an emergency exit on one of the newer planes. We have to almost sit in a passenger's lap to arm and disarm that door. And you know what they say in response? Oh my God, if we have to remove that seat, that equates to $500,000. In my mind, every inch equates to a customer, a passenger's life, possibly. In their mind, every inch is real estate and it's dollars, and it's ridiculous. And I implore this committee to take that seriously. That's what we're here for, that's what you're here for. That's what all of us are here for, the safety in the aviation industry. And when I see the frustration of Congressman Cohen, you can, you can triple that for us out here that have to deal with this every single day. And the reason why our, we know why our passengers are enraged, come on, by the time they get on the flight, first of all, they're already traumatized by the whole travel experience, and we inherit them, and it's our job. And we learn how to diffuse situations. But when you're up in the sky, there's no way you can say, you need to leave and go out that door now. You have to deal with them. And it rests on us. It rests on us in the back of the aircraft. And it's extremely, extremely important that people not only feel comfortable, but that we're able to evacuate them in the case that we can save their life. And in some cases, we can. And Congressman Cohen very eloquently uh, stated some of those cases that have happened recently. So I thank, thank you. you very much for listening. Thank you. And in, cl and in closing, this is like 
the 737 in regards that they want to they don't want to use actual people to test it like simulators would be best they want to do a computer study and have people who are all 150 pounds 59 and just ran a marathon getting off the plane in perfect uh, tennis With a shoes. service animal like thank a donkey you, thank you mr right. cohen you're welcome i recognize mr Fis fitzpatrick for five minutes thank you madam chair uh, thank you all to be, uh, for being here today. Uh, Mr. Samuelson, first, uh, the FAA certifies uh, aircraft mechanics and technicians in the United States. Uh, first question is, do the workers in the farm facilities have similar or equivalent certifications? And is there any reason we shouldn't require these workers to have at least uh, an equivalent certificate from their government before we allow them to perform any safety critical work? Yeah, so the, the answer is absolutely not. There's, there's no lawful requirement that mechanics or so-called mechanics on foreign soil have the same certification as those on USA soil, and it should absolutely be required. The, the playing field should be leveled. Uh, it's been said many times that airlines should not compete on safety, and that's exactly what's going on right now. They're competing on safety by sending work into foreign countries to try to save as much money as possible, even though it's, it's objective and factual that work done overseas, in most overseas countries, is less safe than when it's done on U.S. soil. Thank you, sir. Um, Captain DePete, um, as you said in your, in your testimony earlier, um, and so that there's no confusion, it was Congress's intent that secondary barriers be installed in each new aircraft that is manufactured for passenger air carriers in the United States. Do you believe uh, that the formed uh, aviation rulemaking advisory committee working group is useful and how can Congress act to ensure that there are no more delays uh, and that the requirement is issued by October? So we see this issue is so important right now for the, the security of our passengers and crew. Um, we have examined this issue for so long that we view the current efforts underway as nothing more than delay tactics. Having a secondary barrier is so critical because it preserves, let me make it clear, it preserves the reactionary gap that's absolutely essential when that door is opened. And there's been tests done by the Department of Land Security and how they've tried to take a flight attendant um, and a cart and see if they can get by them and they valiantly stand there and, and try to help as best as they can. But we can do so much better. These are, these are proven to be inexpensive, lightweight, very easy uh, to install and new and then design into other airplanes and then coming up with a million different issues. And I've been on many of those working groups, but here's the real critical part, if I will. Just walk with me for this one. Somebody does get in. Without a secondary barrier, since it's an intrusion-resistant cockpit door, they lock themselves in the airplane, in the cockpit. And now you have an intruder that you can't get at. Because I've often heard them say, this is never gonna happen on a passenger airplane anymore. Passengers are just never going to take it. They're going to, going to you know, run up and assault uh, whoever's trying to do it. But that's the risk. One simple solution. It's so easy, and it's so inexpensive. I've heard uh, A4A even said, well, how much is it going to cost in fuel burn? Well, we used to carry around 60-pound bags with all our gear on it, uh, all our flight pubs, and now we have uh, electronic flight, flight bags that weigh a fraction of that. And I just suggest we call it even and put something in the airplane that will keep our passengers secure and safe. Sir, what is the cause of the delay? And what can we as a committee do to fix that? I think that you can, uh, we can say enough is enough, number one, that we have enough information to go forward. Uh, it's, it's been mandated now and get a concrete timeline for insta installation. And the other thing is to fight back special interests who are starting to already make noise about the fact that we meant type design and not match. We were very careful about how we Put that language together so that would that would be extremely helpful we don't need to mow much more about this but we do need a solution and we can make a difference because it's going to if it happens what will we say what will we do what what do i what do i tell my members nearly 18 years after the 9-11 commission report where they explicitly spelled out how the 9-11 hijackers would zero in on the cockpit and wait for that exchange to occur right. still no action well to add insult to injury, uh, again, as a cargo pilot, we, we have airplanes without hardened cockpit doors. We have animal handlers, some of them foreign nationals, and they, they have syringes and sedatives capable of taking down a large animal, sitting behind the pilots. We've already have instances where 
there's been confusion about what their instructions are and how they're supposed to behave in a cockpit. And it's so clear after 9-11 and the promises that were made by the industry to make sure that hardened cockpit doors are in there. So, um, and that's just one of many of the shortfalls and one level of safety between passengers and cargo. But these are, these are all, we know the solutions to these problems. But ALPA will continue to focus and fight against these special interests that seem to want to put hurdles in the way of the fine work that's being done by this committee. By the way, thank you for the FAA Reauthorization Act. Incredible, incredible. Question is now, can we push it forward without other folks trying to will it away? So, thank, thank you, sir, and thank you for your service. I yield back. Thank you, thank you Mr. Fitzpatrick. Uh, Mr. Brown, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a number of questions, so I just ask the uh, panelists to be brief in, uh, in your response, uh, if, you, if you could. Captain DePete, in your written testimony, uh, you discussed the different pilot licensing requirements at the international level. Yes, sir. Uh, specifically, the International Aviation Regulatory Body recently introduced a license called the Multi-Crew li Pilot License, and yes, uh, uh, you have uh, mentioned some potential safety issues associated with that. Can you elaborate? Yes, sir, I can. Uh, thank you for the question, really important question, especially given the discussions today. Um, so most recently, I wrote a letter to Secretary Liu, the Secretary General of the International Civil Aviation Organization, asking for a global review of pilot training and qualification standards. I want to qualify this conversation before I begin, though. The pilots that in Ethiopia and Lion Air were at a significant disadvantage by not knowing what was on their aircraft. If you know anything about, we're specialists in human factors and startle response, uh, responses, and I think um, Captain Sullenberg was very eloquent about how he described us. In these very automated airplanes with this integrated systems, we need more training, not less. So the only thing that stands in the way, I've seen automation all my life. I've seen good automation that helps me do my function, and I've seen automation that tries to replace me and it's just dumb. And we have to figure out ways to work around it. And those are the things that became, they become distractions almost in a way. So we've seen how it's supposed to work. We can't, if autom automation is supposed to be assistive technology to help us do our job of monitoring the flight path and making sure it's safe, not replacing, because when they, you go down that road, there's not a level of artificial intelligence that exists today where that capability is sound. Um, in this situation, we're looking at, at the failure of the Boeing 737 MAX in particular, we're looking at a series of, very typical to see in these types of accidents, a series of system breakdowns. It's not one thing, there's an, we have a very vast, interconnected uh, aviation ecosystem. But clearly, I want to ask you a question. If you have your family or yourself on an airplane, do you want your crew to be well-trained and experienced, or do you want them to just be trained strictly to rely on automation? That's a simple question, and I'm not relating it to any other events at this point. Because that particular airplane, had a system malfunction that basically made it almost impossible or difficult to control. If you didn't know about it and you didn't were prepared for it, you didn't train for it. Um, we here in the United States, I know it's a long answer, um, there isn't an airplane I've flown where I didn't have a runaway trim system failure, but if you miss it or if there's a startle response or some impact or other distractions, this particular instance, it's, we have a, that's why we've called for more robust oversight into the oversight process, the designation authorization, and the certification process. Thank so, you. Thank you. Long answer, but I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, it's the only um, way to cover it all. So, yeah, a lot you. of these uh, issues uh, require a lot more time than we yes, have sir. from uh, the days here. Mr. Samuelson, uh, in your written testimony, you also touched upon it today. Uh, you mentioned that more than uh, 8,200 aircraft maintenance jobs um, have been moved abroad to foreign repair stations since the early 2000s. Uh, can you go into more detail on your organization's observations of subsequent shortages of qualified U.S. professionals and what we ought to be doing to address those shortages? Yeah, so we don't, I don't think the cause of that is, in fact, the cause of that is not that there are untrained professional mechanics in the United States. The cause of that is that the FAA has 
allowed loopholes. Let, let me clarify. I, I, I agree with you. I think it's the effect. If you've got foreign overseas maintenance, then you have less uh, jobs in the United States, and then you see a declining workforce as a result. Are there critical shortages in the professional? No. Uh, no? Okay. No, there aren't. But I think the airlines use, as, use that as one excuse to continue to export um, American jobs overseas and capital, $2 billion worth of capital. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bassani, um, you mentioned the 10-hour uh, uh, rest period. You also mentioned a lot of conditions that put a lot of strain and stress on the ability of a flight attendant to do their job. Can you sort of put a face on that? I mean, you know, if, you're not, if we're not meeting 10-hour uh, rest requirements, uh, how difficult that is to perform the job of the flight attendant? Okay. Well, first, thank you for that question. Congressman Brown. First of all, it's important to realize that that 10-hour rule, that doesn't mean behind the hotel door. That is from the time you leave the aircraft until the time that you check into your next trip. So that in itself is already a reduced rest. Mm -hmm. 10 hours is not enough, but it's what we have now, and we hope that we can, we need to get that through. It should not be, be being slow walked at this point. Flight attendants must be alert at any minute to be able to perform something as important as an evacuation or perhaps operate the AED machine to save your life if you're having a heart attack. How can they be alert if they haven't had enough, enough sleep? And I'm not talking about just on domestic soil, but flight attendants also fly internationally. They, in America alone, you have three different time zones. So you take, factor in all of those different types of things, and it's so important that they get their rest. Like I said, that's minimal, they need more, but it's so important to get that done for our flight attendants and for our passengers' safety. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stauber, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I really appreciate the, the witnesses and, and your comments. In particular, uh, a point about the safety. Every one of you, the safety was the priority. And before I begin my questioning, I'll give you a little history of my background. I was a police officer for 23 years, ended up as a commander. Safety was the number one priority that the men and women that I worked with went home to, to their families. And to hear um, that there were family members that didn't come back, uh, it's heart-wrenching. And to those family members, our uh, uh, thoughts and prayers, and we're going to do something about it. We will make it better with the experts here. And I appreciate all your comments. Uh, Ms. Schultz, while the workers in the front lines are critically important to aviation safety, it is also important that we have the regulations and safety protocols in place to ensure the safest possible experience. Much of the responsibility falls on the shoulders of the FAA and the NTSB. As you know, in July of 2017, at San Francisco, at San Francisco Airport, an Air Canada Airbus A320 nearly landed on a crowded taxiway mistaking it for a cleared runway. Information about a runway closure that could have prevented this confusion was located on page eight of the 27 page list of San Francisco airport notams. It was the NTSB's finding that a contributing factor was the ineffective presentation of the note of information. How has the FAA responded to this recommendation? Well, thank you for your question. Um, we did issue a recommendation um, to ask that that type of information be a, a methodology to better prioritize that information for pilots be developed. Um, I will need to get back to the committee on the current status of that. We have had some more recent conversations with the FAA, um, but I think I would also comment that because of our engagement with the industry and the FAA, we do understand that they have been looking at the NOTAM uh, process for some time. Our recommendations were more specific to the findings in San Francisco. Thank you. And as you know, I, I uh, produced or uh, put forth legislation to the Notice to Airmen Improvement Act. And I think it's important that uh, industry experts have the ability to uh, ha prioritize that safety information that uh, the, uh, the, the pilots understand uh, the importance. But uh, quite frankly, to have a 27 page NOTAM. Uh, I think, Captain DePere, you would, you would agree with me that uh, let's prioritize the, 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 the information that's absolutely needed so as you command that aircraft, you know uh, the, the concerns around the, uh, 
the uh, runway, concerns around the airport, and you can make a, d a decision whether it's safe or not. Absolutely, um, and I appreciate that question because uh, that was a bit of a game changer when, when that one happened. And in particular, uh, was a very alert crew on the parallel taxiway from United Airlines that happened to comment on it. And I, and I ventured to ask myself a question if that was a fatigued cargo crew under a different set of flight time duty term rules, would they, would they, would they have caught that like that? So there's a, again, that uh, elaborate interconnectedness of a you know, complicated ecosystem, aviation ecosystem. But uh, wrong uh, runway surface landings are a very big issue, uh, particularly of interest to us in the Airline Pilots Association, but also in the FAA and the NTSB. And I think there's various technologies that could be very assistive, like Pharos, I'm sure, yep. final approach runway op occupancy signaling and things like that that can be employed. Uh, better guidance. Uh, we want. We think that in uh, 121 operations, airline operations, that. There should be precision approach guidance to every one way. It was decided by the FAA as the safest course of action in 2000, and yet some people are still trying to push that back. So no, I, I think that, uh, but with with your input, the professionals' input, the legislation, I think will get uh, much better. My last uh, question is, uh, Ms. Pisani, uh, and to go back to the front lines, uh, we really appreciate everything that flight attendants do for our safety. Uh, much of what many of us don't notice. I appreciate you bringing up uh, cabin air safety in your testimony because it matters, and it matters especially because of the long hours you all spend in that environment. I am a co-sponsor of the Cabin Air Safety Act that you also mentioned in your testimony. Would you be able to talk in a little, a little bit more about the legislation and how it can help? Yes, I sure can. In fact, I, first I want to thank you for helping with that act. So it's also very important. Uh, one thing that I noticed, I've been flying for 33 years. Since I've been president of our union, which is only a year, we've seen an uptick in these incidents. And we, in fact, in the past, we hadn't really, we didn't have very many of these type of occurrences. Like I said in my testimony, last year alone, 1,500 reported fume acts from our flight attendants. That's huge. And I know the pilots are experiencing much of the same, and I know that John Samuelson also is an advocate for for getting something done with this as well. It's really important that we have a way to record and to collect data and reporting procedures are standard throughout all of our uh, airlines and systems, in including management and the unions. I've actually hired a specialist in this area about, oh, four months ago because we needed more help. We need someone dedicated to help these flight attendants that are experiencing these fume events and it really is damaging their health. It's, it's a, there's a lot more stories. There are a lot of there's, dedicated you know, Facebook pages, and you know, I'm sure you've seen some of the videos, and I wanna thank you. Thank you for stepping up and helping us with this. You're welcome. We're gonna work on it, and I appreciate your comments. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stauber. I now call on Mr. Carbajal for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Captain DePete, in your testimony, you mentioned the difference in safety rest standards flight time duty between passenger airline and cargo airline operations. Yes, sir. The so-called cargo carve-out. Right. Can you explain to me how this came to be and why this is a problem? And what do you believe should be done about this imbalance? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, near and dear to my heart, of course. Uh, and I know we have somebody in the audience here who was also on the, on the ARC, on the uh, flight time duty time ARC, so I'll try to get this right. But uh, when, uh, obviously after the Colgan accident, when it was determined that fatigue played a part in the accident, uh, they come out, through an ARC process, we came out with industry and regulators worked together with, uh, with labor to come up with uh, FAR 117. I think it's a pretty good rule. And due to a cost-benefit analysis that was done, uh, it was determined, and I say a specious uh, argument at best, because I looked at the what examples they cited to make the determination. They eliminated uh, cargo out of the rule based on an uh, ineffective cost-benefit analysis. I think the cost was supposed to be upwards of 500 million and it was only a $31 million benefit. Now, I would say that that's a dangerous way to go in a sense that you could weigh uh, and maybe weight the idea of what the cost is or the benefit is. First of all, I, like I said, I think it was flawed. They weren't measuring a 777 loaded with dangerous goods barreling down into Los Angeles. They picked a 727, an old aircraft, that fell short of a runway 
in Florida somewhere, in Tallahassee, in a remote area. So um, flawed cost-benefit analysis, but all the same, I think we should maybe look, or you could look, the, the committee could look at as to whether or not so when we're dealing with safety issues, do we want that to be the number one weighted factor, or do we want it just somewhere in the list? Um, second of all, here's, here's the real situation. Imagine this for a moment, and I use this example a lot. Um, you have a school bus in one lane on a highway, and it's, it's proven, uh, and you've got your children on that school bus. Okay? You've got your children going to school on that school bus, and right next to it is a tractor trailer carrying a bunch of freight on it. Um, it's a proven fact scientifically that time awake of 17 hours or more on task is equal to a blood alcohol level of about 0 0.05. So you have a very sober driver driving your kids to school, and right next to them is a tractor trailer. My point in bringing that up was impaired, obviously impaired. My point in bringing it up is we share the same skies. We fly over the same cities. We land at the same airports. Um, I remember the, even the, if you know, uh, traffic collision avoidance system, it was included in passenger airplanes and not in, in cargo aircraft. And it took an almost head-on collision with Air Force One to make that change. So it, it's so, it's a gaping, if I had to describe it as anything, you're only as strong as your weakest link. We have a great safety system, um, but that's one loop, that's one gap that needs to be closed. And here's, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this because it's an important statistic. When you look at the two individual risk factors of both passenger ops and cargo ops, and you look at the frequency with which passengers fly and cargo got, fly, with it kind of tallied if you looked at the number of departures, and we swapped, and we did as much flying as passengers did, we'd have, in a million, in a million departures 10 years, you'd have 276 accidents in that 10-year period. That's the difference in that risk profile. It's startling. So we really need to close that gap because all you're strong is the weakest link. Thank you. Thank you. I'll yield the remaining of my time to Representative Napolitano as she has to go vote for another committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carvajal. Uh, Ms. Bassani, I fly uh, twice a week back to California and, and, and coming here, and I have the greatest respect for flight attendants, the primary connection customers. Uh, they get asked every imaginable question about safety, security, and efficiency of the airplanes and, and the airlines, and I have overheard flight attendants ask quest asked questions that only an aerospace engineer could answer. Yet they have been uh, uh, very uh, diligent and intelligent uh, in uh, answering questions. Do you, uh, do the airlines, the FAA and the airplane manufacturers give you sufficient training to handle any question, especially uh, uh, technical questions, should you, it be your job to handle them? First of all, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you for your question, Ms. Napolitano. That's a loaded question. Uh, we do receive annual training, emergency training. Um, they don't cover questions, you know, for every single incident. No, I, I would say no. Um, flight attendants in themselves are a very inquisitive group, and uh, of course, the longer that you're around the airline and working in the airline, you do gain knowledge that you wouldn't normally have just as a passenger. But uh, there's so much now that has changed in the airline industry. Perhaps that's something that we do need to pursue. And I thank you for that question. I would think so. Thank you very much. I have other questions for the record. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Napolitano. I will now recognize myself uh, for five minutes. I wanted to get back to the um, foreign repair stations, Mr. Stan Samuelson, and I know in your testimony you, you talked about the fact that the, uh, I think both in 2003 and 2015, the IG has identified on several occasions weaknesses in the FAA's oversight of overseas repair stations. The FAA Reauthorization Act of 2012 and 2016 addresses repair station oversights. We're talking about issues of drug testing, um, pre-employment background checks, and, and security screening. Um, now we have Thailand and Costa Rica classified as Category 2, um, and cate Category 2 is defined as the government does not have the confidence, it does not have the confidence 
to meet safety standards. So I just want to ask, it's been somewhat asked already, but what are the FAA's stated reasons for the failure to implement this law? I, I honestly don't know that the FAA has articulated a good reason for allowing these loopholes to continue and allowing the work to be sent overseas. Um, and certainly they don't have a good reason. There is no reason for them to continue to allow U.S. flagged carriers to do work in the countries that you mentioned that have been downgraded. It's a potential disaster waiting to happen. And we've heard a lot of conversation today about safety being the paramount issue in not only the aviation industry, but across the entire transport sector. And I don't think that the current situation with the FAA or passenger air carriers recognize safety as the paramount, um, as their paramount function. I think they are willing to jeopardize safety in order to maximize profit by sending aircraft maintenance into foreign countries that have objectively less safe standards than we do on U.S. soil. And have you yourself been to some of these um, foreign repair stations to witness it for yourself? I have not. I have not, but we do have plans to go to Brazil Thank to, you. Um, to try to access the hangar where American Airlines is doing some work. Thank you. And some shoddy work. Thank you for that. And uh, Captain DePete, do you, is this a concern for you? Oh, absolutely, ma'am. Um, Madam Chairman, I, uh, over my entire career, it's pretty clear whenever we've had a, an aircraft come back from a foreign maintenance station, we, we're always taking a good look, and we ourselves have found instances in all our carriers where that can occasionally happen. It depends on the carriers. Some, are good, some of the countries where we have these foreign uh, maintenance stations are decent players and others aren't. Uh, they typically go to the lowest bidder, and I've always said this. Um, um, skilled labor is not cheap. Cheap labor is not skilled, and, and you end up Thank you. getting what you pay for. Miss Bessini? Do you have concerns about oh my these God, yes. foreign repair stations? Of course stations? we do. In fact, we, we definitely we have supported the TWU in their quest not to offshore American jobs. We think it's very, very important uh, to keep those jobs not only on our soil, but for the reasons that John Samuelson outlined, it's going to be it's going to keep our aircraft safer. And we fly in those aircraft, so we have ex yes yeah, extreme. Uh, interest in how those aircraft are maintenance. So we want to keep them here. Thank you. Um, uh, Captain DePete, um, Mr. Sullenberg was here at our last hearing um, and talked um, about the simulators and about the importance of full motion simulators to, to create that muscle memory. Sure. Um, and in your testimony, you, you, you talk about uh, this, and you talk about how there seems to be a movement um, within the industry now to move more towards non-motion yes, simulators. You, you, you talk about you know, the pros and cons on both. If you could just speak to that, Absolutely. I have 34 seconds left. Okay, that's a really great question, and I'll try to answer it quickly. We just recently had an instance where um, it's a requirement now to have upset and recovery training, losing control of the aircraft, having our train, uh, crews trained to be able to handle that situation. And there were some airlines that were looking at doing this in a non-full motion simulator, and it, it just simply wouldn't get the same effect in terms of the training. So yes, it's really important. And simulators are great. They can do certain things and they can not do others. They never, never a good, they don't replicate a real flight. In fact, I know as a line check airman for FedEx uh, that uh, there were times when people would, that would teach only the simulator and would be only in the simulator, and they were instructors. When they would go back to actually flying the real airplane on the line, they would actually have to take somebody with them just to kind of go through, because it's a, it is a different experience. But as I know the fidelity has increased in some of these machines, but they haven't reached a level to where it you know, equates to really flying the airplane. So your experience matters. Thank you very much, and I thank all the witnesses for being here. This is a, a, a very important hearing, and appreciate you very, very much. And I now recognize Ms. Norton for five minutes. Thank you very much, and I, I second what you just said, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a question first for Mr. Samuelson, because I remember in your testimony that you had indicated th that the FAA had directed agencies um, 
uh, all workers rather, at foreign repair state that Congress had directed uh, workers at foreign repair stations who perform safety sensitive work to undergo pre-employment <laughs> background checks. Uh, do you have any information on the kinds of vetting that is currently being done? I'm particularly interested in whether what happens abroad is consistent with the vetting we require here. Yeah, so what happens abroad is absolutely inconsistent with what, with what happens on U.S. soil, and certainly it's one of the reasons why the work is less safe when it's done overseas, in most overseas countries. And the FAA has failed to follow through on what Congress has. How long, ago, how long have they had so far? Several times over the last decade, oh. Congress has acted. Um, but the FAA is lax in their enforcement, and it's, it's potentially going to lead to a disaster. I mean, we've seen a disaster in the air transport system recently, and certainly the FAA seems to be waiting around for another disaster to occur to start addressing these things. They should be proactively addressing these things and mitigating against the introduction of risk into the passenger transport system. This is an open system. hole, open obvious hole in our system. It doesn't have to do with airplanes, it has to do with people. I'm very concerned and ask for follow-up uh, so that we can get a response from the FAA on, on when they intend to and how they intend to, to, uh, to conform with what Congress has apparently asked them to do some time ago. I, I, Ms. Bassini, I really can't resist asking you about something you mentioned, because you mentioned the kinds of animals that uh, you can bring on to planes. I mean, monkeys, chickens, pigs, I can't believe this. Miniature ponies, penguins, come on. Uh, I, I can tell you, if you brought some of those onto a plane, I'd have to get off. Uh, and so I must ask you if uh, the FAA bill, this section 437, uh, and I don't know precisely what it requires, but I wonder if you think it requires enough to address who gets onto planes, who is really a legitimate passenger. And I'd like to know if Congress needs to do more to keep from frightening passengers with who gets brought onto planes, uh, like your, your response and the response of any of, of you on this. Thank you, Congresswoman Norton. Uh, yes, well, we support Section 337 of the FAA bill, and it, it should clarify it's what 437, go ahead. Uh, what constitutes a service animal in the first place. And, you know, they're not trained, so they need training on how to travel if they're going to bring those service animals on board. You know, a service animal can, uh, is that defined in the statute or just somebody that makes you feel better about being on the plane? I mean, it's, it's emotional. I'm sorry, it's emotional support well, animal. Well, that, that means anything can get on the plane. Well, we've um, seen almost anything on the planes, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, again, there needs I, to be some oversight on this. There, Definitely. I hate to ask for a hearing on this, but I, I am going to have to ask if Congress, for Congress to try to clarify uh, what we mean. And it sounds so open-ended uh, that uh, it is not what, what we intended. Uh, finally, uh, uh, Ms. Schultz, could I ask you, um, um, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the outsourcing of aircraft maintenance to foreign repair facilities, uh, and whether there has been any investigation by NTSB that have linked uh, aircraft ca crashes to outsourcing of any kind. Have, have you even investigated that? Well, thank you for your question. Um, we do not have a position. We have not established a position on that because we have not seen that factor. But I will add that um, clearly we are going to look at all factors that can contribute to a, an aviation accident, um, including maintenance. And um, well, it's outsourcing. I'm particularly concerned about. Right. So we have not addressed that at this point. Do you think? Will you be addressing it. that? Will you be looking at that? 
certainly if the evidence points us in that direction, we will do our, our normal comprehensive job of looking at that as Again, a Again, I'd like to ask the committee to ask that NTSB look at outsource, any outsourcing when it comes to aircraft, we ought to be looking at. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Congresswoman. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize Representative Katko for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Good, good afternoon. It was morning, now afternoon, and hopefully it doesn't go into the evening for you. Um, I, I do thank you all for being here, and I, again, want to acknowledge the parents in the corner as you're there at all these hearings, and uh, our heart goes out to you all, and God bless you for what you're going through. Um, obviously, the name of the game is safety and how can we make it better. And uh, so for Mr. Schultz, the first question I have is, uh, um, there seems to be efforts afoot to um, support, you know, support the efforts over the last several decades to change the aviation regulatory culture from punitive to collaborative. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that and what would that would mean if we could try and get more collaboration, less punitive uh, going on so we can have better things, uh, better procedures going forward. And I'm sorry, was that question for me? No, I'm sorry, it's for uh, Dana Schultz. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that from the NTSB standpoint, um, we have uh, certainly uh, supported the, the uh, uh, approaches that are being taken. We are observers on the commercial aviation safety team um, and the uh, corresponding ASIAS activity that occurs to integrate a lot of these programs that I know Captain DePete mentioned with regard to flight operations quality assurance and the Avi Aviation Safety Action Program. Um, we uh, also have actually, to the point of having a, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with those organizations to obtain information to help us when we're looking at safety issues in a particular investigation. And I think um, what we have seen is that there's a wealth of information in those systems, but it's really predicated on people coming forward and being unafraid to come forward and bring up information that could be very useful to identifying previously un unknown hazards in the, in the aviation system. So um, we do have a, a working relationship with those groups. We've seen value to contributing to our investigations. Um, we are appreciative to the committee for our authority to use voluntary safety information to inform our investigative process. That's where we're at today. Is there things we can do better, even more in that regard, to improve the process? Um, I, we don't have a position in terms of a recommendation on, on those processes uh, because we haven't seen a particular deficiency. Um, I think that uh, for us, it's continuing to be able to work collaboratively with the industry to get access to that information. Um, it can help us identify emerging issues in the aviation safety system through our incident investigation process, much like we did with the um, Air Canada 759 investigation. So we appreciate that authority. Thank you. Uh, Captain DePete, does anything you want to add to that before I ask you another question? I'm sorry, to add to that? You said, yes, is yeah, there anything I, you want to offer on well, that regard? I very much believe in, in, in robust reporting. And uh, in fact, and, and that's a question, right? You're, uh, Pardon me? That's a question you want to address, right? Yes. Enhancing the, OK, I just want to be sure that I'm going to answer it quickly for you. Um, I was absolutely thrilled, and by the way, thank you. Uh, great to see you again, and thank you for all you do for safety and security. You're welcome. You, know, you do a lot. Um, it was really fantastic to have the automatic acceptance of ASAP reports, number one, because the ASAP reports and other voluntary safety action programs have, have contributed greatly to a period of safety in aviation history that have, we haven't ever seen. So uh, thank you for that. Um, it's so important, especially now, since we see fewer and fewer accidents here in the United States, that that reporting continue to be robust and we continue to look at new ways to make it even better because the fact that we aren't seeing the accident. So we need to know where the stress points in the system are. So I can't overemphasize how important that is to us all. I would say that since we talked about fumes uh, quite a bit, that we've been trying to work, uh, walking across the board with others, uh, both uh, industry and regulators, to implement uh, reporting reporting for fume events as part of the ASAP program, and we worked with some of our carriers to get that done. But it would be very helpful if this body could help us in a sense that there needs to be a repository for all that data to analyze it, to see where we can go and, and really completely understand from a very neutral position 
what, what's happening in the airplanes. When, when I'm going to ask you, I mean, if you have suggestions, more details, please submit them to me, and, and I'll be happy to take a look and see what we can Thank do from a legislative much. standpoint. Uh, Ms. Bassani, I don't think I have time to ask you a lot of questions, but I will note that uh, 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 Congresswoman Norton Holmes's concerns are, are well-founded. I think we need to get a kind of a handle on well, the extent of this program. I'm all for uh, uh, accommodating passengers as much, much as they can, but I also don't want to see it, the process being abused and get, getting out of control. And uh, to some extent, I'm a little concerned about that as well. So I, I would just ask you, uh, if you have information on that you'd like to provide us, we'd be li like to hear it. Thank you. We can provide that in writing. Thank you very much. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, in both uh, 2012 and 2016, Congress directed the FAA to address three safety gaps between domestic and foreign repair facilities. One was security screening for safety-sensitive personnel. Another, risk-based oversight of facilities. And the third, drug and alcohol testing. To date, the FAA has taken no actions on any of these, to my knowledge, since 2016. The FAA has approved a net of 200 more overseas facilities. As I understand from the testimony today, more than 8,200 maintenance jobs have been offshored. This outsourcing further enables airlines to evade critical safety and maintenance rules that apply at American facilities. It also appears to me also an effort to avoid organized labor. To Mr. Perone and Mr. Samuelson, how many new foreign repair stations have opened since these directives beginning in 2012 were first passed into law, and what safety gaps exist? So the answer to the question is th it's 200 in the last two years and 300 in since 2016. There's 900 in total. I'm not sure how many since 2012. But certainly, the FAA has created an atmosphere where American passenger air carriers, US flag carriers, are exporting more and more work overseas. And there's only, there's only one reason to do that, and that reason is for profit. It's certainly not because the work is being done safer. And I would further say that the US-based mechanics are an effective stopgap. They're a stopgap for work coming back from overseas facilities. China and South America where the work is done in an inappropriate way, and we've given some examples of that. But they're a stopgap, and eventually work being done overseas is gonna lead to the potential of a disaster happening to American citizens on a US flag carrier. And the, the issue of avoiding organized labor, I think it's, a, it, I think it's maximizing profit at the, at the risk of exposing crew members and travelers to um, flawed safety planes. I think that, that, that's, that's really the goal. Um, we have non-union carriers that are doing it as well. So it's a bad situation. Mr. Perron? So I gotta put my glasses on because it's getting, getting to that point. Um, we had domestically about 3,000 repair stations, four and about 915, but that's growing rapidly. And the problem that we have, the concern is that the FAA has to have inspectors now travel overseas and again, with staffing issues, with money, government shutdowns, that gets uh, delayed or, or backlog. Also, the oversight, would, as we've said, they don't have the same standards as we do for, for domestic. So the folks that are working there are not at the same high level um, that we have in, in the United States. So how much maintenance work is performed outside the U.S. now, if you know, and how much of that work would return to the U.S. if these safety gaps were closed to either one of you? So, the, so one of the issues that's going on is that the FAA doesn't have a, a, syst a system for collecting data for problematic work that comes back from overseas. They simply don't collect the data. So the only time the FAA receives data on it is if, is if there's a problem that leads them to make specific inquiries of passenger air carriers, U.S. flag carriers. And it's about 30% of the work is done overseas now, and that's up from 7% in 2003. So it's growing tremendously. And the idea that 
the idea that this is somehow beneficial to American air travelers or to the safety of American air travelers is ludicrous. It's not, it's not beneficial at all. It's objectively less safe, yet the airlines keep increasing the amount of work they're doing overseas. And there's only one answer for that, and I said it before, it's profit. Uh, as you know, Congress has already directed the FAA to close these gaps. What next steps would you recommend we take to bring the administration into compliance in 30 seconds? Because the FAA has ignored um, Congress. They've, they've just, just ignored Congress. I, there needs to be a moratorium on any more certification of foreign stations until the situation is under control. Mr. Prone, anything else? Yeah, no, I agree, and I think, the, you know, Touching on having an FAA administrator would be beneficial. As we know, we've had a, a, an actor for a while, so that there should be somebody that's going to be in place that can hope and hold the, uh, the agency accountable to Congress's wishes. Thank you. Uh, we're now going into a second round of questions, so I'd like to recognize a ranking member grades. Thank you. Um, Kevin DePito, I want to follow up on a question earlier and just ask for a, a concise answer. So, so there were discussions earlier in the hearing about establishing an early warning system. What I'd like to understand is effectively what process, what opportunities are there in place now for your members to be able to report or identify concerns related to safety? Does, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, it makes total sense. If we're creating an early warning system, basically, what do we have now? No, I, no, it, it actually, and you've helped a great deal here in this, by the automatic acceptance of ACE, because when these ASAP reports are filed, they get processed immediately, or within a, a, a relatively short period of time, and they get analyzed. And before, under the previous rules, as you know, it took, a t it took time to determine whether or not the, the report would meet the standards uh, with a few exclusions. But now we know that that information is so critical to the functioning of the system to learn that early, as in the early warning, that we will put aside whether or not it's to be accepted or not and provide the protections in the program, but it's, we're more interested in seeing the data and making sure we get the data. So it's been a, a very significant, effective uh, in, uh, improvement okay. in, in the past. Okay. So we've been Great. really, really happy about that. I just, I want to understand sort of where we are to understand you know, sort of where we should go or where the deficiencies are. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Look, you, you've raised um, twice now in the hearing the, the, the disparity between cargo and, yes, and, and um, passenger on the fatigue issue, and I, and I appreciate you raising the fatigue issue. It is something that I think is important that, that we continue to, to, to take a close look at and, and make sure that we understand. Um, I, I have a question for you, though. Um, so, so I fly back and forth from New Orleans uh, uh, every week, right. and, and, and I know that we have some pilots that commute often right. with me, um, sure. or I commute with them. Uh, how, how does that factor into to fatigue? And I'm just I'm curious because, you know, last night I finished up at midnight 30, and oh but I didn't go to bed till 2:15. Um, so just because I had an opportunity to sure. sleep, I didn't do it. And I just want to understand how that factors That's, in. Uh, no, I'm, I'm familiar with the question. And um, the 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 committee, the the ARC, the Aviation Rulemaking Committee that uh, handled this, actually looked at the issue. The issue of commuting was brought in. And many of our own, uh, um, you know, in, within our union, many of our own companies institute policies to ensure when you, when you show up for, for your job, whether you've driven five, ten, you know, five or ten hours to get to your base to take a flight or whether you, you are responsible when you sign for that flight to be fit to fly, period. It's just that when they looked, when they looked at the complexities of trying to figure out, well, did they drive, did they fly, did they that, it just became, a, you had to stay within your normal, uh, allowable flight duty period, basically. And if you exceeded it, um, then you would necessarily, you couldn't sign for the flight. So it was up to the, it was up to the, to the pilot to make sure that he got himself in position, ready to fly and fit to fly. Um, the sad part about, you know, the cargo end of it is, is that last I looked, I, I have the same physiology that any other pilot flies, regardless of what they fly. And, and that's where the, the real, problem lies in the travesty in this because we've got people who clearly, uh, from a scientific point of view, are flying relatively impaired um, and it obviously would have an effect on the total system. So it's just, it's just time, and I want to thank the NTSB, actually. Um, been longstanding supporters of ending the cargo carve-out. 
uh, ever since Deb Hirschman's days. So I, I, that. I, I appreciate the information. I just I want to better understand that that issue and sort of and you sure. bring it up you know, whether you drive it. in or you, you drive long hours or what have you and just making sure that we're not looking in a vacuum as we move forward. Sure. Mr. Samuelson, you've been pretty candid on on the the foreign uh, servicing facilities and I and I do appreciate your candor because. As we've talked about, and I believe it was, it was Captain Sully who was here at the last hearing, talked about how we've got to look at every step in the process and not just become myopically focused on one thing. And, and I think it's important. And you're raising some really, <clears throat> excuse me, you're raising some really important concerns about, about safety and making sure that we have safety parity with repair and maintenance facilities. Um, and, and I appreciate your candor. I, I do want to ask a question as I hear you talk about it. I know maybe a little bit outside your lane, but do you sense that it is a, a, a cultural safety issue, perhaps, at some of these other facilities, that, that they don't have the same culture of safety that you have with some of the facilities here? Yeah, I think that's absolutely an element of it. I think there are countries, such as countries in the EU, that have an ex extremely high safety standards and a safety culture that, is pa that parallels American USA soil safety culture. But certainly there are countries that U.S. flag carriers are sending work to that simply don't have the safety culture and don't view safety as the paramount reason for the maintenance work that's done in these planes. Th thank you. And do you think that that culture of, of maybe lack of safety is limited to just the servicing, or do you think that that expands perhaps to other aspects of the airlines as well, including the pilots? I think, I think that when you begin to compare the safety of culture within the United States, it's hard to match it. There are some countries that do, and I think it, I think it goes across the entire aviation industry, not just related to the um, technician work that we do on airplanes, yeah. on jets. Thank you, and look, I, I, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and I wanna thank all of you for your, your commitment to your suggestions on safety. We've gotta continue striving for perfection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, further questions from members of the subcommittee? Uh, seeing none, I'd like to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony today. The contributions to today's discussion has been very informative and helpful. I ask unanimous, unanimous consent that the second record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted to them in writing and unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, no other members having anything to add, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.